Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on behalf of the scientific committee and the organizing committee of uh, 18th uh, CGCon 2021 and the 6th World Congress on Cochlear Implantation in Emerging Nations, I would like to welcome on board Dr. Monish Grower, who is going to be the moderator for today's World Cafe and all the other 10 panelists <clears throat> for today's World Cafe on cochlear implantation in cochlear anomalies. So as all of, all of you know that this concept of this World Cafe was started by Dr. Fatih Baki in, from Alexandria during the Fifth World Congress, which was held in Cairo, Egypt in 2019. So the experts in this field are today, they are going to discuss threadbare on this topic of cochlear implantation in cochlear anomalies. In the first one hour, each one will talk for five minutes. And then the second hour will be driven by Dr. Monish Grover. He's going to conduct a panel and elicit answers for the questions, various questions he has to put in. So at the end, he's going to be <clears throat> moderating and preparing a document of creating a guidelines for the benefit of the fraternity, which is going to summarize today, but ultimately is going to give a 12 minutes presentation on the third day of the conference, that is on 14th of November, Sunday in the morning session. Okay, with this brief uh, introduction about the World Cafe, I would like to invite Dr. Sumit to introduce Dr. Monish Grower, who is going to be the moderator for today's session. And then Monish Grover will take over the session. Thank you. Dr. Sumit. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. Greetings to all. Uh, it's my pleasant task today evening to introduce Dr. Monish Grover, the moderator for today's uh, session. Dr. Monish, he finished his MS from Ames, New Delhi, and his senior residency from uh, PGI Chandigarh. He is presently a professor in SMS Medical College, Jaipur, and also he is the joint secretary of the Cochlear Implant Group of India. Dr. Monish has played a pioneering role in starting Cochlear Implant Program in Rajasthan and also helped 15 centers to start Cochlear Implant Program in India as well as abroad. He is a member of expert committee for framing cochlear implant guidelines under CG and has 75 publications to his name. He's also awarded by Honorable Chief Minister of Rajasthan for his exceptional work in the field of deafness. Dr. Monish, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sumit. For especially those kind words which really don't deserve. But uh, yeah, so welcome everyone and thank you to Sunil Dr. Shankar Medikari for you know planning this whole thing out. And uh, we'll just start with a short CV of everyone out here. Can we have this uh, CVs of everyone, Anil? Yeah, thank you. So we have with us Dr. Ali Mehros, who is from Egypt and is in the department of ENT at Al Azhar University. He's a professor of otology and neurotology and his current research is about cochlear implant, pulsatile tinnitus and stapes surgery. His skills and expertise include those in hearing loss and otolaryngology and he has 18 publications to his name. Welcome Dr. Ali Mehros and we'll be hearing you soon on, about your topic. Can we have the next slide please? Okay. Next, Dr. Himanshu Swami, a dear friend, presently based out of New Delhi, and he's heading the department at Army Hospital Research and Referral Delhi Cant. A very avid neurotologist and little skull based surgeon. He has been to various up countries for his trainings and was a special registrar uh, in, uh, and is admitted in special register in United Kingdom. Recognized postgraduate teacher and monitoring committee member of indigenous cochlear implant by Debel. So he has been in the Indian Armed Forces and also been a DNB and MS examiner on special loca several locations. With more than 30 publications to his name, he also has authored various textbooks. 
and is the principal investigator for project on balloon exchange in tuberculosis in united kingdom welcome dr himanshu dr arthur castelo from brazil so that's the next continent we go to he is professor at university of campinas and is responsible for otology and cochlear implant section at his institute i just had a word with him he had they have done more than 1500 implants and a very good experience on malformations he is also in the steering committee member of gcm so welcome dr arthur and we will be hearing you soon again dr hetal patel uh, one of the leading ent practitioners from the western part of our country she is from mumbai and the kind of economic capital of the country and heading the department at st gs medical college in km hospital mumbai she has done a fellowship in endoscopic sinus surgery at graz australia and skull based fellowships at pittsburgh and university of pennsylvania she received various awards the important ones being that of emerg rf cooper and the cg award for her surgical paper she has numerous publications and has been invited as faculty to various countries all over the world she is a versatile surgeon does loves doing endoscopic sinus surgeries cochlear implants microangel surgeries recently doing a lot of bahas also and she she does have a club for microsia and anosia patients under the name of here for all at hospital and running the one of the largest cochlear implant programs in civic hospital good evening ma'am dr somitra shah sadly is not able to join us because he's traveling right now but he belongs again to the western part of the country that's surat and is that rashtruti ent hospital and that's the only private hospital which is recognized by the state government for the cochlear implant scheme in the state he's also the winner of rf cooper awards special interests include cochlear implants middle ear surgery and endoscopic sinus surgery dr laila telmasani from saudi arabia this middle east she is a professor of otorhinolaryngology at the university of daman and she her academic pursuits include a mini fellowship in otology and neurotology fellow of royal college of surgeons in otorhinolaryngology kfu fellowship in otorhinolaryngology and um, she has membership of various professional societies and organizations and done a lot of work on cochlear implants and malformations she has some amazing papers on the same thank you ma'am dr sumit mrig a very good friend and in fact the organizing secretary for the next sijicon at new delhi india he is a senior consultant heading the department or and the cochlear implant surgery uh, mini department kind of as it ensued that's max hospital and one of the youngest cochlear implant surgeons in india nation done more than 350 implants and operates in more than eight countries in the world so it's very difficult to get hold of him again first indian surgeon to start independent cochlear implant program in the continent of africa various awards to his name sushrut award max ceos award so a person with multiple awards actually and special interests include treatment of deafness cochlear implants baha bone bridge any kind of bone conduction implants and snoring and sleep apnea surgeries so that's so much for all of us dr asha agarwal the only audiologist in this panel so she is going to play a very major role she is a very senior audiologist and speech therapist at sir gangaram hospital new delhi with more than 40 years of experience to this field she is director of asha speech and hearing clinic one of the first kind of clinics in the country especially in north india and this clinic is an integrated mix of experience and technology it's it's you need to visit this place to really see what the efforts she has put in welcome ma'am dr levinson roglu i'm sure nobody actually you know needs any words for him we all know him very well if we all not have met him we have been reading and hearing about him so and just to you know officially introduce him he belongs to uh, right now presently at least in ankara turkey where he travels a lot he he did his training and residency at hasatab university in ankara and then became an associate professor and professor in the same place he was a research scholar in house institute los angeles california where he did a lot of temporal bone studies i mean that's where his you know the amazing papers which he has the histopathological slides which he has wonderful work which he did at that place and for last 23 years he has been practicing only otology and neurotology specific interest being in area malformation so that's we all know him for the various papers and you know so it's kind of i'm sure almost 80% of what we talk about is going to be his work today 
as I mentioned, he's in a lot of histopathological studies, he's in a lot of ABIs, 120 articles in English language and various peer reviewed journals. He was also the past president of Otology and Neurotology Society in Turkey and the chair, chairperson of Department of Otolaryngology, Hesitab University between 2006 and 11. And then he also did a four year audiology undergraduate program, which he set up in his own university. Welcome, sir. We are very happy to have you after, you know, especially when you were so busy with your schedule out there. And Can Monish, you... Monish is going to be the next president of the GCIA. Oh, that's wonderful. So that's kind of a VIP we have out here. It's so good to have you again. Yep, so can we the next? Dr. Pritam, a very dear friend, he did his MS and residency from Ames, New Delhi, presently working as a faculty at Ames Bhuvneshwar, a blessing to the state of Odisha where he started the CIA program and is doing many surgeries in every week, which, you know, which whenever he is available in the state. Done various researches under ICMR, lots of funding, especially for the tribal regions. Principal investing in more than 10 projects right now, more than 50 publications, various textbooks, also launched very innovative kind of a person. So also launched an Indian hearing screening test, which is an Android based online hearing evaluation. So that's what Dr. Pritam is. So thank you for that. And now let's, you know, apart from these official introduction, let's start up with the presentations and the discussions which we plan to have. Okay. Is, okay. Right. So this World Cafe, we have around like, we have already gone about 10 minutes. So we have around an hour to really have a presentation, then about 40 minutes to discuss them out. And we'll probably have the discussions intermittently also. We're going to discuss about cochlear vestibular anomalies and cochlear implants. We have these panelists, which we just talked about. I just mentioned these three things because that's what we really look to have. We, we will probably be looking at a very free discussion, right? And any type of malformation, we may actually, you know, intermittently discuss them after every specific subtopic which we discuss out here. The aim is obviously to frame recommendations regarding cochlear implants in these malformation based only on existing literature. And let's not have our personal experience count a lot. I'm sure it's going to be biased a bit with our personal experience, but let's keep them as little as possible. And we had a word with Dr. Sunil that, and we actually planned that, you know, let the recommendation divide into two parts, which I actually mailed to all of you also essential and desirable. So we will be dividing all these recommendations into these two subheadings for every malformation. We're not going to have any pharmaceutical support, whether it's cochlear implant companies or otherwise. We will be discussing to start with what is normal, and then we go ahead with what is abnormal. So the first talk probably will be dealing with, you know, what are the normal values, and we'll also include that in our recommendations as to what really is normal. So these are kind of models which we have at our department which we you know, kind of used to teach our residents and our students. We know these histopathological photographs. So maybe the terminologies of modulus, cochlear apertures and the various separations will be used in the, topic, in the topics which we discuss as to identify various malformations. So this is what it is. Now, you know, just to start off with, it's, it's in the early part of the 18th century or the later half of the 18th century other than Dr. Carlo Mandini actually dissected a temporal bone of an eight-year-old boy who died because of an accident with a carriage. He developed actually gangrene in his lower limb and could not be saved because of lack of antibiotics. And the child actually died. Because the child was congenitally deaf, Dr. Mandini actually went ahead and did a temporal bone dissection. And that's for the first time he actually, you know, mentioned three things, which included absence of the superior turn of the cochlea dilated vestibule and an enlarged vestibular aqueduct. It's kind of, you know, if I, I were to do it even now, I might not be able to really find these three things on a temporal bone dissection. Uh, but he could do that in those years, which actually was a major thing for any kind of cochlear malformation. It was one of the best things which happened and it was a problematic thing also because at least for the next two centuries or so, we kept on calling every malformation as a Mondini's dysplasia. And then we had various classifications coming in. And today we know that approximately 10 to 30% of patients with congenital hearing loss have a cochlear malformation or a cochlear vestibule malformation. So we all know Jackler's classification, which came out in the first classification in 1987 on the time of arrest basis based on that. 
and we had Phelps classification, then we had the Zing classification, and ultimately St. Dr. Sinaroglu's classification. And that's what we really follow right now. And various terminologies, which we are going to discuss in detail. So 2010 paper, which talks about in these things in real detail, are these terminologies, right? And we all will be talking about it. In 2013, we had rudimentary autocyst and cochlear aperture anomalies coming in. And 2016, we had the cochlear hypoplasia 4 coming in. And as of what I know, this is the present latest classification given by Tosinoroglu. So we will be discussing all these things with the help of various presentations. We also had our own classification at our institute, which we actually based on cochlear morphology, modulus, and lamina cribrosa. So that's another classification which is existing. We had a few papers on the same, but for the sake of, you know, the standard guidelines, we would actually discussing the thing which is most acceptable in that sort of synaroglu's classification. We may, at the end of these discussions, you know, try to subdivide these anomalies into mild, moderate, and severe anomalies for people to understand if we all agree on that. Otherwise, we just continue with the terminologies which are being used right now. So that's something we need to keep in mind if you really want to divide them into mild, moderate, and severe. And as I mentioned, for the purpose of recommendation, the most accepted classification, what we'll be using, that sort of synaroglu's classification, and we may divide them into mild, moderate, and severe. So thank you. That's just kind of an introduction which I really wanted before we start off. And now can we, uh, let me just stop sharing. Can we have the next talk, right? And that's the first talk from audiology point of view. Dr. Asha Agarwal, please. And Hello, good, evening. good evening, ma'am. Just for the sake of it, we can have a discussion after every talk, right? For two or three minutes, we can discuss that if we really want to change something before we discuss everything in the end. Dr. Asha, ma'am, go ahead, please. Share your screen. Yeah. Just a minute. I'm opening and sharing my presentation. Yep. <clears throat> Is it? Yeah. Hello. Good evening, everyone. All the professionals. It's my privilege to present in this forum, while Cafe, the CR Cochlear Mind Formation Investigations Audiology. So, as our concerns with the cochlear malformus, uh, malformation in candidacy is that uh, according is in accordance to the residual function of with the residual function of organ of portal and presence of ganglion cell, we get the results in our audiological investigations. So, I will be following the investigation as per the same as uh, Dr. Mohi says, Sonogudu's classification the findings of different malformations. The basic audiological test, as we all are aware and know, for the candidacy of cochlear implant are OAEs, diagnostic vera, emitters audiometry, SSR, BOA, Pyoton audiometry, speech audiometry, and aided audiometry or conditioned audiometry and speech perception score. Of course, a speech language assessment too. Now I have clubbed these three malformation together as more or less we see the similar findings. So this uh, mitral aplasia, rudimentary autocytes and cochlear aplasia. In all these patients, we do not have any hearing level whatsoever. Whatever low frequencies we get are the responses which should be considered as a vibrotectile. The most uh, important and to still we find is a common cavity malformation. So the audiological ass assessment to support the presence of residual function of organ of quartile and eighth nerve, because we all are aware that it is we need to find out from audiological point of view, if the nerve carrying are the, how many percentage of the nerve fibers are audiologically conducting the acoustic sound. So this is most important, uh, most important malformation. So intensive therapy with the hearing aid should be done and added audiogram should be done to review the candidacy criteria. And of course, that there is a re uh, report in this babbling also in the speech cases, speech assessment when these children are treated with the hearing aid. 
proteological findings in cochlear hypoplasia are we can see the full spectrum of hearing loss that means hearing loss may vary from normal to mild moderate or profound hearing loss or there may be pure conductive hearing loss also be present in some cases mixed hearing loss the patient may benefit from stapes and profound hearing loss are also associated in these cases the audiological findings in incomplete partition of the cochlea these patients do not have characteristic hearing loss as their audiometric threshold stress vary from normal to profound the hearing loss can be symmetric or asymmetric but it is usually progressive it is possible to have sudden sensory neural hearing loss as well the airborne airborne gap at low frequencies the normal tympanometer reflexes are present that may be mixed type of hearing loss so electrophysiological test for asymmetrical hearing loss are recommended the mass threshold to be obtained with dual channel equipment and boa should be done with insert transducer for monitoring the progressive loss the impedance audiometry has an important role to find the progressive loss by contralateral and sinusoidal reflexometry in the mal formation of enlarged vestibular aqueduct cases there may be progressive or a sudden sensory neural hearing loss is seen there may be down sloping or a high frequency sensory neural hearing loss or a mid frequency picked audiogram is the second most commonly seen audiometrical configurations the mid frequency picked audiogram is up sloping in the low frequencies and peak at 1k or 2k and the slopes downward through 8 kilohertz boa with insert transducer for monitoring the progressive loss and the impedance audiometry are recommended outcomes are generally good coming to cochlear upright cochlear aperture abnormalities we may get severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss but as the cochlea is normal the oa may be present and child may pass newborn hearing screening if automated abr is not obtained so their hearing loss is typically discovered later on in the childhood based on the family's concerns of lack of sound awareness and language development if the newborn screening protocol involves oa and automated abr this marker formation can be diagnosed during the infancy the diagnostic audiological evaluation will reveal profound sensory neural hearing loss so auditory checklist should be provided at the time of hearing screen this is the pictorial presentation now coming to the challenges we find in marfan cochlea post implant uh, are the mapping is very challenging in these cases because managing the high fluctuation impedance open circuits and short circuits Ma'am, we need to. Ma'am, can I can I just interfere out here? Uh, we have another talk from your side on the habilitation part. Okay. Okay. Post implant things, maybe we can include it there. If okay. that's okay. If that's okay with you. Yeah, fine. So these were the mapping parameters. I was. I thought yes, since sir. it's an audiology part, I thought I will. I have put it here. Okay. So if you think. Uh, yeah, because there's a uh, uh, shooting out of the time rehab. Okay. Okay. So. Yes. So this being a audiological, I thought uh, I will be adding this. Yeah. So we need to manage the facial nerve stimulation also and non-auditory perception. So audiological mapping plays a very crucial role in these cases. So as we can see that um, there may be speech coding strategies which can be changed from S to speak, or the mode of stimulation may sometimes be BP plus three or MP one plus two or MP one. the rate is usually may go as high as a 500 or 720 and the pulse width also in few of the cases it has gone almost up to 400 the dr of course is maintained between 30 to 40 by manipulating all stimulation mode and rate and um, pulse width so in conclusion i would like to emphasize that that a bunch careful selection of the candidate is very important the detailed case history should be taken and of course in correlation with the radiological ct mri reports the audiological finding has to be correlated 
the counseling of the recipient's family is very important. As we know, surgery may also be challenging and may need special design electrode. So the, in these cases, use of wireless accessories, assistive listening devices, FM systems to improve signal to noise level helps for better auditory perception and speech outcome. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ma so these are the references. Uh, can you just share your slide on the various audiological investigations which you mentioned in the initial part of your presentation? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know what? What I would really be happy is if by the end of this, you can also make up your mind and we all can discuss as to which of these are essential for every case of malformation, right? And which of them are desirable or, you know, for specific malformation because uh, we need to frame those guidelines and this is probably going to be the most important thing is if what our investigations are essential when it comes to cochlear malformations and few of them can be desirable, right? So well, thank you. we can discuss this at the end again, but this yeah. is which I need. So, anybody thank else? You. Can, I, can I make a comment? Yes, sir, please. Uh, thank you very much. I think it was an excellent overview of the audiological uh, evaluation. I think the most important challenge is to, uh, to evaluate a child with hypoplastic cochlear nerve. Which one of these do you prefer or rely on most um, in, in a patient like that? I think it is, sometimes it is more important than MRI uh, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Maybe the behavioral part is something which I would focus on. I mean, just for your you know, information of everybody out here, we have a separate, we had a separate World Cafe yesterday on hypoplastic and aplastic cochlear nerves. So uh, I'm sure they have gone into a lot of detail, but just for the sake of interest, now that you've mentioned it, I would, you know, love to have those behavioral audiometries coming in a lot with the hearing aid trials. I mean, what's your viewpoint on that? Dr. Levent? Yes. You asked me? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, what is your this thing? I was thinking that the behavioral audiometries is something that, which... That's be... exactly what I am thinking because um, all the other tests, um, the, uh, the experienced audiologist evaluation of a child, sometimes two audiologists, uh, one actually in the room conditioning the child and seeing the response uh, suddenly... <clears throat> Uh, with the um, uh, during the test with insert earphones, I think it is very very important in choosing in making the decision between the CI and ABI in yeah. these difficult cases. And other than that, uh, we uh, we take it as as important as the MRI uh, in making this decision. Do you do you agree with me, uh, Mrs. Agarwal, Agarwal on, on this issue? Yes, yes, I fully agree, certainly, because in MRI, when we see single nerve, and it is difficult to find out if the nerve is carrying how much uh, cochlear auditory nerves and how much vestibular nerve. We had been doing added audiogram. I remember case even till three years or four years of age, till we really found that it is audible and child is hearing with audio, and it is not vibrotectile, but it is definitely hearing threshold with the hearing aid. That is very satisfying to the cases and the family expectations and for us as a clinician also, because this child is definitely going to be getting advantage after cochlear implant. Yeah, so makes sense. I think, let's, let's thank you very much, ma'am. Let's go to the next talk. Can you stop sharing your screen? Asha, ma'am? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Now, the next person, we have Dr. Preetam, right? And Preetam is going to talk about talk about the radiology and the genetics on the guidelines part of it. Pritam, can you share your screen, please? Uh, hi. Hey. Uh, is my screen visible, please? Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, great. Uh, so I would want to uh, uh, thank the organizing committee and especially my mentor and brother, Dr. Monish, for uh, providing this uh, opportunity and being among the stalwarts in this field. Uh, so I'm going to be talking very specific points about radiology and genetics. Uh, sorry. 
Yeah. So in radiology, uh, there are basically two options that are available with us. One is a high resolution uh, computer tomography, and the other one is an MRI of the brain and the inner ear. Both are complementary and very essential in malformations, and they should probably be done under general anesthesia. And that's what the majority of the literature talks about. And this photograph basically tells you how far some of the institutes have gone to make it a easy experience for these children to undergo radiology. So the protocols of radiology, you would want to go for axial scans in, an, in, a, in a CT scan with 512 into 512 metrics at least, which, which is somewhat related to the resolution. Then 0.6 millimeter thickness is what is at least required, but then it ranges from 0.3 to 0.7 millimeter contiguous cuts. Then the coronal images are reconstructed from the anterior edge of the petrous to the posterior edge of the mastoid bone. That's to involve whole of the uh, temporal bone the window centering level and the window width, which is basically uh, dealing with the brightness of the image and also the amount of images that can be incorporated should be 700 Hounsfield's unit and 4,000 Hounsfield units. It is desirable to have 3D surface reconstruction and volume rendered uh, images when you're dealing with CT scan. In an MRI, you can get either a 1.5 Tesla or three Tesla images. A three Tesla is definitely the one that is preferred. You usually go for axial heavy T2 weighted images. You go for a slice thickness of between 0.4 to 0.7 millimeter. And then the 3D sequences, many are available according to each and every company which has patented a specific uh, technique. Then you would also want oblique sagittal cuts uh, especially uh, perpendicular to the internal artery canal for the vestibular cochlear nerves and to uh, assess them. And then there is, it is essential to also image the brain simultaneously because that helps to identify any coexistent uh, brain deformities or brain problems also in the same setting. What are the most essential views that you need to look into? Uh, you would have to look into the mid-modular view, which is basically showing you the uh, uh, the, the modulars, then the mid basal and the apical turn and the uh, cochlear aperture uh, and uh, the, uh, the uh, vestibular aqueduct and the facial nerve. So these are some very important things that you need to see. And this is one of the most important cut. And the other one is the cut just below this, which passes through the round window niche, where you can see the uh, basal, uh, apical and the middle turn very clearly and then the septae differentiating them because that helps in uh, understanding or differentiating the different malformations. An MRI scan uh, on, on a 1.5 Tesla, you can go on and see the, uh, the fluid inside the cochlea. You can see the nerve coming out. You can see the septae there. And then obviously you get an idea uh, when you go for oblique sagittal cuts of how the nerve is. And if you have a three Tesla, then that's, that's the best way to go forward because it gives you better resolution. And then you can go on and identify the osseous spiral lamella, differentiating the vestibuli, tympani, and then you can see the uh, uh, different segments or different, uh, 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 diff uh, different apical and basal turns of the uh, cochlea much more clearly. And then you can go on and measure the uh, specific values of the cochlear nerve. And then you can, you can come out with uh, uh, better prognosis in these uh, children. So what's normal? So what's normal is usually cochlea is at least two and a half turns and more than 25 millimeter. But uh, as for the newer paper by uh, Dr. Levent, again, the basal turn length should be uh, less than 7.5 millimeter and the mid molyara height should be less than 3.42 millimeter to be termed it as a cochlear hyperplasia. And I'm sure the others will uh, talk about it more. The vestibular aqueduct, again, uh, it's considered to be enlarged if it is more than 1.5 millimeter. That was, uh, 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 that was the usual criteria that we follow, valvasory criteria. And there's also a Cincinnati criteria, which talks about uh, one millimeter in the midway and, and at the operculum, it is more than two millimeter. So you can use either ones uh, with the Cincinnati having a showing more and more or, or increases your diagnosis of enlarged vestibular aqueduct. The cochlear aperture is again, uh, it's normal if it's more than 1.5 millimeter. Uh, it's tenotic and less than 1.5. And usually when there is a, uh, uh, when there is a complete absence or uh, the, the lack of cochlea is there, then you'll find uh, a natritic sort of a cochlear aperture. The internal artery canal 
usually it is between two to eight millimeter. It could be stenotic, usually as in a case of cochlear aplasia, uh, or it could be dilated as in when you have a, 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 a incomplete partition type three, and then you could have normal also. So majority would be between two to eight millimeter. So for the cochlear nerve, uh, the literature talks about uh, the dimensions in vertical, horizontal, and the cross-sectional areas. Uh, but uh, as a whole, uh, when, a, when a radiologist sees this, if you can do this on a three Tesla, that's well and fine. Otherwise, they tend to look at the facial nerve. The cochlear nerve is supposed to be a little bit larger than the uh, facial nerve. And if you have a uh, unilateral problem, then you compare it with the opposite side where it is, whether it's of equal size to the opposite side cochlear nerve or not. And that's that's a general sort of a thing. But these are the values that one tends to look at if one can. Then the presence or absence of laminar cribrosa, because now when we talk about prognosis and preparation for surgery, you need to essentially look for the laminar cribrosa, which is present, whether it's absent. So that helps you prepare for the surgery accordingly. And as I said, the more and more we go into the newer types of electrodes and how much should one try. So we have a paper by again by uh, Dr. Monish, which has specifically uh, looked at the Asian population and the cochlear duct length in an Asian population on an average is 29.8 millimeter as compared to the higher value in Caucasian population. And then there was this nice paper also by uh, Dr. Anand, uh, Mr. Anandan, which talks about the two turn length from the lateral wall. So this is something which is desirable. It's not definitely essential, but this is something nice to know. In genetics, uh, it's very vast and multiple papers talk about multiple uh, mutations. There are around 7,000 mutations involving more than 100 genes. And these are the uh, sort of uh, a summary from one of the review article, which was published in 2021 from the Italy. So it talks about all the common uh, syndromes which are associated with uh, which type of deformity. So these are something that one needs to look for. Uh, and what are the options that we have? So because the whole genome sequencing has been done, either one can go for a uh, specific gene analysis. So we have uh, uh, genes which are associated with deafness, which we know. So we can uh, put the uh, testing uh, for those specific genes, or we can also go for a whole genome sequencing, which can be done if it's available for you and if cost is not an issue. So uh, th these are some of the uh, things that can be done as we go forward. And these are my uh, uh, references. Thank you. Ritam, just a few, you know, requests. One, the normal values which you mentioned. I mean, it's amazing that you could actually get all of them on a single presentation. Could you just, you know, mail it to maybe me or all of us in a tabulated form so we can use okay. that. Secondly, sure. I mean, and just a discussion for all of us. Uh, for malformations, now many centers are actually for otherwise, so cochlear implants are going towards mainly MRI and avoiding a CT scan. When in India, I know majority of us do both. What about the rest of the world? I mean, is is are both the things required for all types of malformations? The CT and MRI, Dr. Laila and Dr. Castello may just answer that for us. For us in here in uh, in Amai cochlear implant unit in the eastern part of Saudi Arabia, yep. we do both CT scan and three Tesla MRI for all patients. Perfect. Perfect. And, and do you have an option of 1.5 versus a three Tesla? Because in our country, I know we don't have three Tesla available everywhere. So do we make it essential that for every malformation, we should have a three Tesla MRI or a 1.5 Tesla? I was discussing this with Dr. Sanjay Vaid, who is a very eminent radiologist in our country. And he said, if you're doing a 1.5 Tesla MRI, do it with surface coils. I really don't know what it means, but that's what he actually mentioned. So when it comes to guidelines or recommendations, do we mention a three Tesla MR or 1.5 Tesla MR? What's the opinion of the panel? It should be a, it should be a desirable thing. I mean, uh, three Tesla a, becomes desirable. Yeah. Is yeah. 1.5 Tesla is essential. Yeah. 1.5 Tesla would be essential. That's obviously. Okay. So then. So uh, can, I, can, I, can I just add a point? No, when I discussed it with our radiologists, they were very clear. Uh, so they told me because anyhow, you're getting a CT scan done. If your CT shows that uh, you have a malformation in there, then definitely ask for a three Tesla. If your CT is normal, then go on with a 1.5 Tesla MRI. That's what is our protocol because we have both a three Tesla machine and a, and a mm -hmm. 1.5 Tesla machine. So that's mm -hmm. how they have, they have asked us or that's what they have conveyed to us. Dr. Levin, final word. Yeah. 
Can I, can I make a comment too? Absolutely. I think the two most important factors is to make this under general anesthesia because a slight moment, uh, even if it is three Tesla or uh, 1.5, uh, will uh, make the image uh, not clear. And um, whenever I have a patient coming in for CI or ABI with, uh, with an MRI who is not good, I do not operate unless I have a very good MRI making me satisfied, showing the nerve, uh, whether it is hypoplastic or aplastic. Because once we do cochlear implant on one side and the child is not progressing and we are thinking about CI or ABI in the contralateral side, we don't have another option of performing MRI. So right at the start, because we have a lot of referrals and at the beginning, yeah. a patient is scanned with, uh, with an MRI, which may not be as good as uh, our uh, hospital standards, but to start our work, we should have a very good MRI, if possible, three Tesla, because three Tesla shows the hypoplastic uh, cochlear nerve much better. So yeah. in future, we are uh, much more prepared for future if we have the option of three Tesla MRI under general anesthesia at the start. Point taken. So we'll have 1.5 Tesla as essential and, a, and a, with a good CT scan and three yeah. Tesla as desirable. And we would also add a word general anesthesia for yeah. The MRI being done. Yeah. And you know, one other thing, the Dr. Grower, is uh, the tomography. And we have a lot of hypoplastic cochleas coming in for us for surgery, and they they do not have the uh, standards as Dr. Pritam pointed out. And I don't want to operate uh, those cases with a bad tomography. And unfortunately, we give another set of radiation to the one year old at the start because tomography shows us the position of the facial nerve, which is very important, very, very important yeah. because uh, then, uh, because many times it lies on the promontory and you can easily yeah. damage the facial nerve. I've seen those videos of yours. Okay, point taken then. So I think that's where we end this subtopic and we discuss this again. Dr. Himanshu, can we have your talk now, please? And he's going to talk about the other evaluations which are going to be part of it and the vaccination protocols for malformations. Yeah, can you uh, see my screen? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So uh, I'll, I'll be basically talk, talking on two topics. One is uh, the syndromic and the genetic association with the cochlear anomalies. And the other one is immunization. Now, both the topics are such that you can't get it in one single book or a chapter. So, uh, and uh, nothing is uh, sacrosanct in this because uh, as we'll see, the inner ear malformation, syndromic and other association, it's a relatively new thing. As you all know that inner ear malformations are present in 20% of sensorineural hearing loss. And because of uh, recent advances in uh, uh, genetics, there, is, there has been an explosion in identification of the genes which are specific for inner ear malformation. Now, uh, what it helps in, if, if you identify the gene, you can do a targeted gene panel, which is uh, less time consuming and it's cost efficient. So, uh, and also uh, these genes are common genes to some other systems like thyroid or, or, or the kidneys or even the eyes and the brain. So they might have an association with the other organs. So you can establish a connection between inner ear malformation and the other organ anomalies. Or if you identify the other organ anomalies, you should focus your attention on the, uh, on the inner ear, the neuroradiology. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll quickly go uh, through uh, the slides because it's not uh, possible for me to discuss each and every syndrome. Uh, so, a complete, sorry, in complete labyrinthine aplasia, 1% uh, of the, it forms 1% of the case of cochlear malformation, and it is frequently bilateral. So, it is associated with LAM syndrome. Now, only 60 cases have been reported worldwide of this syndrome, but I believe it's, it's, it's much more common because when I was, while I was making this slide, last week I saw in my candidacy criteria 
one patient was uh, one child was fitting into lamb syndrome uh, and i i identified because i was you know, searching for the syndromes so i believe it will be much more so it is characterized by labyrinthine aplasia microtia and microdontia so it's it's caused by mutation fgfp gene then uh, there is a recently identified association with fox7 mutation syndrome which is uh, characterized by uh, characterized uh, by various other organ uh, anomalies including anomalies in the cervical bones eye bones the carotid artery aplasia and similar sort of association is there with wildervank syndrome so but th these cases are very few uh, in literature it might increase as the awareness increase uh, as of now there has been no association with any genetic mutation uh, for rudimentary otocyst for common cavity uh, it has been assumed that it is non genetic origin however recently there have been eight cases associated with bosley sale alloreni syndrome which is a, a part of uh, hox7 mutation then uh, there are a couple of cases in rr1 gene mutation and one case in 22q11 deletion syndrome the djort syndrome so now people are associating uh, malformation with these uh, genetic mutations coming to cochlear aplasia there is again no specific gene mutations however in experimental studies on animal models there have been an association found in one study with pax2 mutation but not in human study in ip type 1 no specific uh, gene mutation in type 2 uh, we all know pendrett syndrome it's a biallelic mutation in slc 26a4 gene for dilated vestibular aqueduct they can be either biallelic or monoallelic slc 26a4 or isolated uh, nk cn j10 and fox11 mutation in in these mutations only isolated vestibular aqueduct is seen there is much more literature in this but i believe it's a common pendrett syndrome is common so i'll not uh, uh, spend much time on it coming to the incomplete partition type 3 earlier it was linked to x uh, link deafness now a gene has been identified pu pou 3 f4 which is associated with the also with the faulty neural tube development leading to hypothalamic dysmorphism it is also associated with the uh, holister uh, i forgot the name of the syndrome will come to it later then cochlear hypoplasia now there are four types you know the association with branchiootorenal syndrome is uh, been done in one study by robson it shows unwound appearance of the cochlea that is there is an anterior offset of hypoplastic middle and apical turns in a study found that in all eight cases of bronchiolar renal syndrome in all eight cases this this finding was there so we must keep in mind this finding unwound cochlea then uh, cochlear hypoplasia is also associated with wardenburg syndrome and uh, type 4 is associated with other syndromes which i'll summarize later so this is the same summary which dr pritham had done. uh mention in the slide uh so there are various types of genes and various syndromes we must keep in mind we must keep our minds open whenever we are seeing a child we must actively look for some other organ dysfunction or abnormality and if we are seeing a child with some uh, congenital other organ abnormalities we must look for uh, the ear anomalies that is the take home message so uh what it will do is it will help in targeted genetic investigation which will save time and money it will exclude syndromic association it will exclude inner ear malformation in specific gene mutation we must this i feel should be an essential part we must include genet geneticist and a pediatrician in our candidacy meeting and it also it will also help uh, in counseling the patient of the possible risk of the similar uh, problem in the future pregnancies so with that i come to part, end of part 1 uh then shall i come to part 2 now immediately yes absolutely and i think you can focus more on if there is a specific difference in malformed cochlea when mm -hmm. it comes to immunization protocols yeah okay
uh, that everybody knows that uh, 30 cochlear implant is a 30 times more at risk for meningitis. That's why uh, a specific immunization program was started in 2003. So uh, in cochlear, in, in, in children who have got, or, or in patients who have got cochlear malformation, there is a chance of persistent CSF leak. 32% uh, in a few studies, up to 32% may have persistent CSF leak which in turn increases the chance of either uh, early or late meningitis. So it is very, very important to immunize uh, patients who have got malformation. So there are other risk factors like anatomical, and obviously it's more in area anomalies. One, you are creating a, 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 a conduit, which is connecting the inner and the middle ear. And secondly, there is already uh, a conduit between the inner ear and the brain. So it leads to more problems in inner ear anomalies. Uh, the rest are all common for uh, uh, the normal anatomy as well. Right? So now there is a lot of confusion between vaccination, especially in different parts of the world. Now, there are three organisms which will cause meningitis. It will be a pneumococcal, pneumococcus, hip, hemophilus, or meningococcus. Now, meningococcus uh, studies have shown that the, uh, the implantees does not carry more risk than the normal population. So meningococcus has gone out of favor. It has been recommended in some uh, guidelines to give meningococcal vaccine only uh, in countries which have got endemic meningococcal uh, meningococci. But I don't think, uh, except for a few African countries, uh, anybody has got endemic of meningococci. So a uh, hip vaccine, every, uh, everybody is giving, every country is giving as a universal uh, vaccination. And more, if, 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 if the patient has crossed more than five years of age, you as such don't uh, need any vaccination because uh, it's assumed that uh, the patient has developed immunity. So I'll focus mainly on the pneumococcal uh, vaccine. Now, this is the CDC recommendation. So there are three uh, doses and one, three doses from two to six and a booster dose from uh, age of 12 to 15 months. Okay, and then you give a, this, there are two types of uh, pneumococcal vaccine, a conjugate vaccine and a polycyclide vaccine. A conjugate vaccine has got 13 strains and the polycyclide vaccine has got 23 strains. Both work in a different way. Uh, uh, the conjugate uh, vaccine works on beta-2 cells and con uh, PSV3, uh, the polysaccharide vaccine works on beta-1 cell. So beta-1 cells are not developed in less than two years of age. So that's why we give uh, polysaccharide vaccine after two years of age. Let's come to the specific. This is the Indian Academy of Pediatrics. Thankfully, uh, they have now uh, made PCV as a universal uh, immunization, uh, have added PCV in the universal immunization program this year, and it's not limited to higher risk group. Though they have recommended for cochlear implants, they have recommended for pneumococcal infections. So they have not uh, recommended meningococcal vaccine for cochlear implant. So okay. they have certain high risk conditions are there, but only for pneumococcal infections. Now this is the CG uh, vaccination schedule, which have got some issues. This is not correct. Uh, the polysaccharide pneumococcal vaccine, I'll uh, tell you why. So after, after a lot of permutation combination, I mean, if, if the child has been immunized from right from the beginning and it's going in a normal way, then there's no issue. You give three doses, uh, within first six months and then give a booster dose and then the patient child is ready for implant. But what about the catch-up doses? If the child has missed the doses or only half of the doses are given. So this is a flow chart, uh, uh, which is there. Uh, it looks a very busy slide, very complicated, but the essence is that you first ask uh, the child or, or, or the parents that whether they have received a PCV vaccine or not. 
so if they have not received a pcv vaccine good enough then you according to the age of the child uh, if the child is 2 to 6 months old give three doses in other age group give at least two doses of pcv if the child has crossed more than two years give a uh, polysaccharide vaccine after eight weeks of PSV, uh, PCV. So that is a very clear if the child has not got any vaccination. However, if the child has got vaccination, then uh, if the child is two to six months old, then continue with the uh, vaccination schedule with booster at 12 to 15 months. And if the child has crossed seven months, then at least two doses should be given. And uh, the gap between the two doses should be eight weeks, minimum four weeks. And the gap between the implant and the uh, and the last vaccination should be at least two weeks. And if the child has again crossed two years, then uh, give a uh, P PPSV vaccine. So looks complicated, but it's okay. actually. But I think what what makes sense is that we will probably change it in CG guidelines per se. Yeah. For malformations, meningococcal remains absolutely not required. Also, right. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going continuing with hip and pneumococcal. Yeah. Okay. So if if the patient is adult, then there is only one change. If the patient has crossed sixty five years, then you need to give one one more dose of PPSV. That's again for normal cochlea, right? For okay. for any for any any implant. I know. Okay. So, seems very exhaustive. Yeah. Okay. Good. So everybody knows about the effectiveness of vaccination. I don't need to elaborate on that. Thank you. Thank you. Seems exhaustive. So, I mean, I think the two things which we do is essentially HIB and pneumococcal yeah. and nothing about meningococcal from our side. And we mentioned the various mal the syndromes which we need to know because unless we know them, we won't look for them, like the LAM syndrome which you mentioned. Yeah. Monish, so, can I just yeah. interrupt? Yeah. Monish, uh, we are doing the guidelines or recommendations not just for India. This is the World yeah. Concept from GCIN, so include Africa. Okay, so then in that case, we may add meningococcal for, meningococcal for desirable. Okay, fine. So it will be desirable, desirable being meningococcal for those places where endemic areas, areas in endemic areas. Right, thank you. Okay, so we go to the next talk. That's by Dr. Arthur Castlow. So, can you share your screen? And that's on various vestibular system malformations. <laughs> Grover. Yep. Yes, my sounds better now. Absolutely. Yeah, Can you share your screen? Was not good. So share my screen. Just a moment. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Arthur Castillo. I'm from São Paulo, Brazil. I work at the University of São Paulo, uh, public university in São Paulo, Brazil, where we have a center uh, where we do cochlear implants and uh, autologic surgery. Uh, we have so far. 1,500, 1,400 uh, cochlear implants. And of course, we have uh, bone, bone anchor hearing devices also. I'm gonna talk about cochlear implant and vestibular malformations. Uh, so the things that we're gonna talk now uh, have been talked by previous uh, colleagues here. Uh, but anyway, uh, we will try to summarize what we have in terms of uh, malformations and cochlear implant, vestibular malformation. It's impossible to talk uh, of vestibular malformations and not talk uh, uh, cochlear malformations because most of the time they walk together. Just a moment. This is our new hospital. It's an ENT hospital that's uh, read here in Campinas uh, and it's fully dedicated to ENT. So first, and of course, I'm going to talk about large vestibular aqueduct, uh, large vestibular aqueduct syndrome is a congenital inner ear malformation that commonly results in progressive uh, sensory and neural hearing loss. And the cochlear implantation is possible in those cases, depending on the kind of cochlear uh, malformation that you're gonna find in these cases. Um, uh, large vestibular aqueduct syndrome patients are uh, heterogeneous uh, population of patients. In order to... And usually the uh, CI surgery on those patients is not very complicated. Most of the time, uh, we have patients uh, with a large vestibular aqueduct and uh, incomplete partition type two. And usually it's possible to perform uh, the surgery with no problem. So 
we need to uh, have in mind that those patients may have cochlear malformations, of course. Uh, we need to explore a geometry following cochlear implantation in patients with enlarged vesicular The result may vary depending, uh, of course, of the type of the type of the malformation that we find. Uh, there is statistically significant augmentative benefit to years with an enlarged vesicular aqueduct that have been implanted. So, uh, the consideration here is to implant uh, the morphology, specifically the presence of uh, incomplete partition type two may hinder the CI benefit, of course, depending of the level of malformation that we find in those patients. But as I said, most of the patients with a large vestibular aqueduct, they have uh, some kind of a poker uh, malformation, but most of the time we can fully insert the electrode. So uh, sometimes we use left wall electrodes, sometimes we use uh, perimodular electrodes depending on the kind of cochlear malformation that we find in those patients. Uh, of course, if you have a, a large flower aqueduct, we have seen some patients in your ear uh, malformations. So we need to have that in mind. Uh, evaluate the audiometric performance and speech production outcomes of cochlear implantation in children with in your ear. So we need to have that in mind. Uh, incomplete partition type one, in this case, in this paper, represent 17% uh, with incomplete partition type two, 29%. Uh, uh, so type two is uh, the most common uh, malformation, cochlear malformation related to enlarged vestibular aqueduct. Common cavity, which is very bad in 15.9%. Uh, cochlear hypoplasia in 15.9%. And isolated enlarged vestibular aqueduct in 21.5%. Uh, so. And large vestibular aqueduct was uh, the coexisting anomaly in almost one fourth of the subjects in this paper. So a lot of that. Uh, Algeometry performance and speech production were significantly improved in all inner ear malformation patient groups. And no significant difference was uh, observed between the scores of patients with different types of anomalies. So again, the consideration in patients with large vestibular aqueduct is to, is to go for the implant, the results with Cochlear implant uh, usually is quite good. In specific patients, uh, those with uh, uh, Char syndrome, for example, uh, they have some uh, specific considerations with the vestibular malformations because those patients, they have uh, malformations in the semicircular canals, superior and posterior semicircular canals. Canals may be malformed on those patients and uh, of course, uh, they have cochlear uh, uh, malformations like hypoplasia, or in some cases, may be absent. So, if we find uh, semicircular canals malformations, we need to look uh, to the to the eighth cranial nerve to see if we have hypoplasia or absence. So, in this case, there is a formal contraindication to perform cochlear implants. So, they are not good candidates for cochlear implantation. Of course, if they have a good cochlea, which is not very common in those patients. And if they have the cochlear nerve, which sometimes is not common in those cases, usually have hypoplasia, you can do cochlear implant, but usually those cases are not good. So uh, Char syndrome is a complex cluster of congenital anomalies. Middle ear anatomy is often abnormal, affecting surgical landmarks and making the identification of the cochlea very difficult in some cases. Uh, hypoplastic or absent auditory nerves on both sides affecting their outcomes with the cochlear implant. So in these cases, we have to uh, have in our minds that they may go for sign language, bilingual early intervention approach. So uh, if they are co uh, they're candidates, we need uh, to uh, have an improvement of the communication with sign language. Uh, we can study uh, these malformations in patients with, uh, uh, with cochlear implants. Uh, uh, we, we, have, we can study the temporal bones uh, uh, of patients with cochlear implantation and to determine what kind of malformation we find. So in this paper, 38 species, uh, specimens with uh, inner ear malformation, uh, cochlear plasia in three patients, cochlear hypoplasia in 30 patients, and complete partition in three patients, and as a 
may uh, give us some hints that um, uh, even though uh, at the surgery or at MRI, we don't realize that we have a slight malformation of the cochlea, that may uh, be there uh, when you study the temporal bones of those patients. So um, if, if we have vestibular malformations uh, or cochlear malformations, we need to be aware uh, of the different types that we have. And why is that? Because some of those abnormalities like hypoplastic or obliterated mastoid or a plastic or obliterated round window may lead us to a complicated uh, scenario of uh, cochlear implants. In children, we need to evaluate surgical experience and auditory function and the progress to speech development, as said before. Uh, and, and patients with uh, malformations with large vestibular acidut, we may uh, find CSF gushers or endolymphatic gushers, but they're not very important most of the time. And uh, most of these patients, they have uh, some kind of Mondini malformation. Uh, incomplete partition uh, type 2 malformation, which is associated most of the time with enlarged vestibular aqueduct. So uh, the most successful group of patients with in-ear malformation uh, is large aqueduct vestibular. So uh, the results, again, with uh, enlarged vestibular aqueduct, uh, depending on the, the degree of malformation of the cochlea, are good results because usually it's just uh, incomplete partition type 2. So in summary, the uh, CI and the uh, large, uh, large vestibular aqueduct, usually we have good results. We need to be aware that in those cases, we have some gusher, some oozing, uh, usually can be uh, handled in uh, the surgery with the plugging. Uh, Cochlear implant with a large vestibular aqueduct uh, and the in partition, uh, incomplete partition uh, may be fine. Usually it's type two which is good. We can perform cochlear implant most of the time. In patients with uh, Charge syndrome, we may find very complicated cochlear and vestibular malformations, which may lead to moderate to poor result. And the vestibular malformation is associated with cochlear nerve hypoplasia, hypoplasia and absence in those cases. So if we find real semicircular canals malformations, we need to look at the internal canal to see if there is also hypoplasia or absence of the cochlear nerve and not perform a, a CI surgery on those patients. Good now, you know, thanks for that. Uh, I just have one question, maybe others can chip in, is uh, when you mention CSF gusher, right? Uh, what exactly do you mean by it? Because, you know, gusher in IP3 or in IP1 would be very different the, this the is, kind of CSF yes. or ooze which you see in a large vestibular aqueduct. So yeah, yes. you term it as a CSF gusher in a large vestibular aqueduct, or you want to call yeah. it just- combined? Usually in, in, in a large vestibular aqueduct, we, we have just oozing or endolymphatic gusher as something. But in, in patients with uh, charge syndrome that goes to, to uh, CI yeah. surgery, we may and have I, CSF leak. If, if you just discuss isolated and large vestibular aqueduct, right? That's, that's what we'll have a specific recommendation on. If everyone agrees, then we just put it as a mild CSF ooze or a leak, right? And no gushers, right? I think yes. you agree yeah. on that? Okay, agree. Yes, that, that I, that I put specifically for patients with charge syndrome yeah. that have a like specific that. bad formation, yes. Absolutely. But anyway, yeah. you're right. And we can use all types of electrodes. There is usually no facial nerve anomaly and the results are almost, outcomes are almost as good as children with normal cochlear anatomy. Right, so these are what our probably the recommendations would be it, and we look out for Pendred syndrome in these patients. Monish, can I add one thing? Yes, Samit, please. Sure. If you see uh, grossly the outcomes, the morphology of LVA isolated and IP2 is almost the same. There is not much of a difference in terms of architecture, in terms of complications, in terms of facial nerve, yeah. in terms of almost no. comparable. Yeah. There is not much difference. Yeah, agreed. And we'll discuss this when we come to IP2 from your yeah. side. Yeah. Uh, I, I was just wondering now, there are three criteria which exist for diagnosing LVA. The Cincinnati, the Velvasori, and the Wilson's criteria. We all agree with the Velvasori criteria, right? And that's the recommendation you put in. Dr. Pritam also mentioned in it, right? Pritam? You are uh, yes. 
Yeah, I'm okay with Velvasori criteria, but the uh, literature talks about that uh, the Velvasori criteria uh, tends to uh, 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 decrease the number of diagnosed cases of EVS. So, so that's something Cincinnati, that everybody should. Maybe Cincinnati overdiagnoses it or. Overdiagnoses it. Yeah, so that's yeah. also an issue. But overall, the recommendation we'll mention all the three criteria and we may pray more emphasis on the Velvasori criteria, which is more accepted one, right? Okay, thank you. So now we go to incomplete partition one, if everyone else is okay with what we discussed till now. And incomplete partition was supposed to be discussed by Dr. Somitra Shah. He's not here, so I'm going to present, you know, what he was supposed to present. He has sent over his slides to me. And I think that's where, again. okay. So in the- Yeah, Dr. Levent. Um, we have gusher, we have oozing, and the third thing is pulsation that we see in uh, okay. uh, in these uh, IP2 okay. cases and enlarged vestibular aqueduct. So we can see three things. Gusher, okay. which is 6% in uh, IP2, oozing, and pulsation. So when we see pulsation, actually there is no fluid coming out of the scale of tympani, but the pressure is transmitted into the inner ear. I think we have to define uh, these three things in this. Uh... So, so can we do that? Gusher, we mentioned that as a free flow of CSF into the middle ear cavity. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oozing. We mentioned oozing. Intermittent as... flow of CSF. Okay, wonderful. Intermittent flow with without high pressure, right? Yeah. Okay. And pulsatile would be no flow, just pulsation. No fluid. But if you if you place some fluid, we see the movement of the fluid. If yes. we remove the fluid, there is no fluid coming from the inner ear. But we only see this indirectly. Right. So we just see a kind of a pulsation with no active fluid egression from the inner ear. Is that okay? That's then? true. Okay. So we'll be using these three terminologies. Now, just for the sake that everybody of us is on the same platform, we're going to use three terms and we'll define them in the recommendations. Pulsatile, when there is no active fluid aggression from the middle ear, only pulsations are seen when you open up the cochlea. Oozing. Um, Dr. Dr. Grover. Yeah. Uh, can I just uh, say hello to my friend uh, Levin first? And I'll make actually a comment out of what he has just said now, because um, when we say CSF coming out, um, I think we all know that CSF is out when we have IP3 or IP1, for example, but in IP2, uh, when there is actually ooze, uh, it is usually the, actually the perilymph rather than the CSF. Uh, um, so I, can we just define it as a, as a perilymph rather than CSF? Because CSF is really in IP3 and IP1. I would agree on that. And, and in fact, we have a talk on IP2 coming just after IP1. So maybe we can take that query if, if you're okay with it at the time when we are discussing IP2. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sumit Mareg is actually going to talk about detail in it. So as of now, we talk about the three terms, pulsatile, ooze, and gusher. Pulsatile is no active fluid aggression from the inner ear when you open up the cochlea. It's just a pulsation seen inside it. Oozing is when there is an intermittent flow without any high pressure of CSF when you open up the cochlea. And gusher is when there is a free flow of CSF into the middle, middle ear when you open up the cochlea, right? So these are definitions which you are going to use. Okay, everybody okay with that? Just one small quick point. Yeah. Uh, is the management different for all the three? So we can also add that. So how to manage all these three? Okay, yeah. So gusher is obviously different. Pulsatile and oozing. Yeah, yeah. So, Dr. Levin, do you want to comment on that? Is the management different for pulsatile and ooze? Um, you know, if, if there is pulsation, we don't need to do anything for that. If there is oozing, it is easily managed. But don't forget, IP2 is, uh, it looks like a very simple um, surgery, but in 6%, we have a true gusher. So, uh, actually, gusher it comes from the defect in the modality. So the yeah. pressure that is coming from, uh, via the aqueduct uh, is creating a defect in the modalis. And sometimes we have a severe defect resulting in a severe gusher, and that needs a lot of um, uh, good packing around the electrode, choosing an electrode with the stopper, 
and also we all, uh, we we make lumber drainage afterwards. So even if it is an IP2, it's a very critical situation. Yeah. Dr. Levin, but position what, is okay. Yeah, Dr. 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 What, what Dr. Himanshu was actually asking probably is. Is there a difference in management of pulsation versus an ooze? Right, gusher is absolutely different. You know, so we agree on that part. Ooze versus pulsation. Is the management any different? Or oozing? You know, we have to we have to close every leak very efficiently before we leave the room. So this is this is mandatory. So even if it is oozing, it is less easily. It is. Easily controlled, that's true. But okay. we have to do the same thing. But pulsation is not a big importance, uh, actually. Ooze, but but in... we have to think the other side. So uh, if we do not uh, create a good barrier between the middle and inner ear, and the patient has a middle ear infection, it can easily pass to the inner ear, causing um, meningitis, because we have, you know, we have a, a very yeah. enlarged uh, aqueduct. So these are membranous structures which can easily transmit the um, uh, infection either okay. way. So, so I think in the we have ooze, to close it yeah, In the ooze category, we add intermittent flow of CSF with no high pressure and it is which is easily controllable, right? We define that like that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Can I have just uh, I need the clarification yeah. really. Do we really uh, can we really differentiate between and we see we say that this is a CSF and this is a perilymph. Like even we can have a gusher in a normal cochlea. Even I have a child with a totally normal cochlea and I have a real gusher which fill my the middle ear and the mastoid cavity. So can we really say this is a CSF or this is a perilymph? I think, I think beyond the first one ml, everything which comes out will be a CSF. And okay. you know, that's what I would consider. This, this, is, this is my point. I mean, if I have a gusher or a real ooze, I cannot make sure this is not a CSF. It is CSF from my side. Dr. Levin, is it CSF? Gusher, I mean, if it is a profuse and ongoing leak, I think yes. it should be a CSF. But you know, sometimes in staple surgery, uh, we have some, when we open, we, sell, we have some little fluid, but it doesn't come afterwards. So this is pedaling. We can see that in cochlear implantation as well, but if it is ongoing, because the production of pedaling is not as fast as um, uh, we, we remove yeah. with suction. And, this is uh, my point. I think when we are talking about ooze and gusher, we are talking about CSF. That's yeah, true. point taken. Point yes. area, actually, so we'll mention that. And pulsatile will be probably just perilymph pulsations, yes. which we are seeing. And an yes. ooze and gusher would be actually CSF then. Perfect, right, ma'am. So agreed on that. Okay, we come to incomplete partition type one. That's Dr. Swamitra's presentation. He obviously, we all know there are three different types of incomplete partitions. These are the line diagrams in Dr. Sinaroglu's paper. Now, IP1 is by definition something which lacks the entire modulus and the interscalar septations. So it's kind of a cystic structure which usually has a large dilated vestibule and there can be a defect between the internal acoustic canal and the cochlea. To differentiate, Dr. Swamitra mentioned that we have to differentiate between the cochlea and vestibule so that we are sure it's not a common cavity. So the cochlea is located in its normal position in the anterior lateral part of the fundus and lacks the modulus and intrascalar septa. So it's kind of a cyst in the anterior lateral part of the fundus. The external dimensions of IP1 are similar to normal cases, and that's how we differentiate it from cochlear hypoplasia. The cochlea is accompanied by, as you mentioned earlier, by an enlarged dilated vestibule. There might be a defect between the IAC and cochlea due to developmental anomaly, and this could lead to gushers, and audiology would almost always be a severe to profound hearing loss. Management, therefore, is by cochlear implants. You would be happier to use straight or lateral wall electrodes. Modulus hugging electrodes should not be used. That's what it goes in our recommendations. So we'll discuss that if anybody wants to change that. We'll have to anticipate a CSF gusher. And if I'm not wrong, in approximately 50% of the patients and we prepared for it. And in the worst case scenario, we will be needing, we might be requiring a subtotal petrosectomy. 
he also mentioned that it's possible to have a cochlear nerve aplasia in IP1 and therefore some patients may not be a candidate for CI surgery and may require AB1, ABI and it, ABI may be needed on contralateral side in case of insufficient progress with the cochlear implant especially. Another important point which we all should remember and I think Dr. Levent also has a similar video presentation in the Sijicon which is coming up is the recurrent meningitis which can occur in IP1 patients even prior to cochlear implants because of defective stapes foot plate and the CSF filling the cochlea from the fistula present out there. It's kind of a classically, all those of us who have operated on these patients, a classical cystic kind of a, you know, structure which comes in the CPS foot plate area and, you know, which can burst intermittently lead to the CSF otorhinorias, and this can get infected again and again leading to recurrent meningitis. So it's characteristic of IP1. If I may add, you know, to Levent may actually, you know, kind of uh, agree or disagree, CH2 has a similar kind of possibility. But obviously, IP1 is much more common than CH2 and therefore is characteristic of kind of IP1. So key points, no modulus, wide communication with the IIC leading to CSF gushes in approximately 50%. Electrodes with complete ring, so that's a full banded electrode, not modulus hugging ones. And if you are using a contour electrode, it may better not to take out the stillet. Otherwise, they may curl in the center of the empty cystic cochlea. I would actually differ. That's what Somitra has mentioned. And maybe others can pitch in if it's okay to use a contour advance, which is, you know, the electrodes facing medially half pended electrodes on that. Abnormal facial nerve course, vertical segment of facial nerve is usually dislocated anterior medially towards the promontory. Lies over the oval and round window, surgeon may be unable to use the facial assist approach in very rare cases and be ready for CSF gushes. That's kind of the anomaly in facial nerve, which can be expected, right? And variable outcomes. So thank you. That's Dr. Somit's presentation. Now, you know, if we could just discuss it out, the points which I got confused one is, uh, is it okay to use a modulus hugging electrode in IP1? Anybody wants to chip into that? I just will have one comment that yeah. I have... Uh maybe 10 cases of IP1, all of them I, full, I used full banded electrode, yeah. non-modular hugging electrode, because we know the basic abnormality is there is no modulus. So we know not exactly where is the neural element. Yeah. So I don't think there is any point of using a modular hugging electrode or electrode which will coil on itself. So I think Agreed. it should be- So it could be a full be banded a lateral wall electrodes, non-modulus hugging types, right? Everybody agrees on that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And chances of CS, yes, Dr. Levin, go ahead, please. Um, I've seen one other thing is that uh, when we have gusher, Monish, yeah. the, the CSF can come into the uh, middle ear, but our electrode can go into the internal yeah. auditory canal. So gusher means that there is a connection. So I, um, um, I have seen a few modular hugging electrodes in IP3, but also in one IP1 where there was recurrent meningitis. So the problem is if you take out that electrode, it can cause facial uh, or cochlear nerve uh, damage. So in IP1, if there is severe gusher, my suggestion is not to use modular hugging electrode. Just for two reasons. One reason Leila mentioned, we don't know the position of the neural tissue. The second, if the electrode goes into the IAC, it is like this. And when we remove it, we can yeah. damage the nerves. But straight electrode happened to me as well. No problem. Just take it out, make another okay. insertion. Okay. And the chances of CSF gusher 50%? We put the uh, 50% in, in IP, IP1, 50%. Okay. okay. Now, just one last question. How are the... Yeah, sorry. I want to add something. Go ahead, ma'am. Well, they have said that uh, you can use the uh, to advance with stillet. That means it becomes a stiffer electrode and there's more chance of it going to internal artery method. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I would I actually agree with what you're saying. So, and plus it's just a, you know, half bended electrode anyhow. So I think we'll not do it with that thing. And Anish. how the, yeah, Samit. Yeah. Just one thing, do you think that we should uh, make a recommendation that 
most all of the cases of IP1, you should plan for a fluoroscopy guided to avoid since you have a gusher, you should do it under a fluoroscopy. That is better because you should avoid getting it into the IAC. Maybe we can make it desirable. Yeah. So maybe if it gets into IAC, like Dr. Levin said, if you are using a straight electrode, it may not be that damaging, but a modular hugging or, you know, if you take it out, it may damage the nerve. Yeah, agreed. So um, in our recommendations in the desirable thing for IP1 and IP3, we can put it as, if there is a gusher, we put it as under fluoroscopic guidance. Right. One last uh, thing. Outcome, we can just make... I'm yeah, sorry. sorry. Uh, uh, we can just make a C arm is mandatory, uh, or or an X ray should be mandatory before the patient is shifted out of the OT, which which That's makes it essential. more acceptable to Pritam, all situations. Pritam, there is a difference between taking a final C arm picture once you have done the full insertion, yeah, yeah. and you take uh, serial pictures to see where the electrode is curling inside the cochlea, especially if you have oh, an empty cystic space and yeah. you don't know where the neural elements lie. Let me uh, just let me just clarify this. Essential would be and post interoperative C arm or an X-ray, right? Yes. And desirable would be a fluoroscopic guidance. Yes. This is in case of modular yes, hugging. Monish, yeah. one more one more point I want to make. Yeah. They're talking about radiology. Yeah. I read a lot of articles, including the Dr. Levent as well. It it generally most of them have a consensus that for IP one and IP three, ideally most of these cases you should have a post-operative CT scan. Sometimes your, your intra-op CM may not give you the best of pictures. I'm not saying it is to be done in all the cases, but yeah, it is desirable to get a post-op CT scan, especially in cases where you have a hypoplastic cochlea or you have a wide ISC in IP1 and IP3 okay. where the chances of when getting it, into this. Total event, do we go ahead with a post-operative CT scan for IP1 and IP3? No. You know, we are giving too much radiation to children. And that bothers me. So we always have uh, transorbital x-ray. That is mandatory. Okay. Uh, I have seen clinics who don't do that, even if the NRTs are normal. But I have seen electrode curling on itself, even though uh, the tests are normal. So this is mandatory. Uh, yeah. in, um, in, in patients with gusher, that has to be done intraoperatively. Because yeah. if we see a straight electrode, we should we should repair it at that moment, yeah. not post-operative day one or day two. So, uh, but tomography is a different thing, giving radiation. And uh, if, but if we have a problem of the electrode curling um, around the uh, internal auditory canal, that is another uh, issue that needs a tomography to see the position because sometimes it is curled in the IAC and it looks like it is in the cochlea. So that happened to me a few times with the cochlear hypoplasia type two. Sometimes they have a wide connection with the vestibule and the electrode goes into the cochlea and immediately into the IAC or vestibule. So, or sometimes common cavity. But, but three cases, transorbital is sufficient and we have to avoid extra um, radiation to children. Good enough. Now, final word on outcomes of cochlear implants in IP1. Are they as good long-term results or do they plateau down earlier? Whom do you ask? Anybody who wants to chip in, right? It's an open discussion. We just published our results on uh, outcomes, uh, about 274 cases. Right. And IP1s, um, you know, the worst cases are common cavity, the second hypoplasia, and the third IP1. So, so these are the cases that sometimes we perform AVI to the contralateral side. Right. And so we would say the results of IP1 are not as good and you would usually plateau down earlier. For example, IP3, the surgery is difficult, but they always have a very good cochlear nerve. So definitely IP1, uh, uh, cochlear implant, but IP1s, Sometimes they may need ABI on the contralateral side if we don't have a very good outcome. Okay, so let's even, go to the next sorry, talk. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Even with a normal cochlear nerve, Levent, in um, IB1, even with a normal you know, size cochlear nerve, or do they notice that they have hypoplastic cochlear nerve? Yeah, you know, Leila, if they have a very good cochlear nerve, I think uh, we should never do ABI in those children, but 
we have some patients with additional uh, deformities, IP1 cases that they never reach the level of other uh, patients. So uh, we have to keep other factors uh, as well. Um, but if they have a nerve, definitely they, they have to get uh, a cochlear implant, no doubt about that. Okay. So now we have half an hour left with us. And I think we are discussing all the recommendations as per the topic we are talking about. So we will not, we'll not have any other further discussions. So we go to the Monish, next. We need another one and a half hours for the rest I know, of With the you, day. we can actually continue for the whole day. But yes. I think Dr. Sunil, that will really not allow us. So uh, Dr. Sumit, IP2, right? And yes, discuss the major points. Okay. So uh, thank you, uh, Sijikon, the organizing committee and the scientific committee. And thank you, my dear friend, Monish. And a uh, pleasure to have Dr. Levin here. Uh, so as you know, we have already discussed a little about, uh, about Carlo Mondini. Uh, in fact, if you go into the history, you know, the first case of inner ear malformation was reported in 1983. And uh, it was reported as Mondini. And it went for a very long time. And every malformation was, uh, you know, called as Mondini. And it was earlier based by Jackler et al. on the polytomographic findings. Till, you know, we had, um, you know, even in the Shuknet's classification, if you see the histopathology, even a empty cochlea or a empty saccule or utricle, they were all called under the Mondini. But it was Phelps actually who differentiated Mondini from pseudo-Mondini based on their predisposition to the meningitis. And uh, the classic Mondini, what we call as IP2, was then defined with the triad of having a cystic cochlear apex, a dilated vestibule, and an enlarged vestibular aqueduct. So these three were the important components, and a classical Mondini was reserved for an, an, a malformation having all three of them. Now, if we see uh, the external architecture in a classic Mondini is normal. The cochlea has 1.5 turns and not the full turns because the middle and the apical, there is absence of an interscalar septum and which gives appearance of a cystic cochlea. If you see the modulus, it is only present in the basal part and is absent in the uh, middle and the apical turns. The vestibular dilatation is important that it is minimal. Of course, it is seen dilated, but it is not as dilated as we see in IP1. And EVA is almost always present. So I have read Dr. Levin's article also, and he would be the best person to comment. But yeah, I have read a few other articles by Blake Pepsin, by many articles, which says that a large vestibular aqueduct is almost always present in all cases of IP2. And the ganglionic cells are only present in the lower 1.5 turns of the cochlea. So all of us know about the embryogenesis uh, with the jacular uh, classification. The arrest is happening at the seventh week, which is just before a normal cochlea and vestibule is formed. So going to the pathophysiology, I think this is the most important, which actually explains about what happens in a Mondini. The enlarged endolymphatic duct and sac is the only genetic abnormality, which is actually responsible for transmission of high CSF pressure into the cochlea. Dr. Levent also mentioned uh, in the previous uh, this uh, slides that EVA, the enlarged vestibular aqueduct, actually transmits the pressure, what we see as a pulsation, so it ends up causing a vestibular dilatation. It ends up causing a scalar vestibuli dilatation. And it is responsible for a modular defect. Now, if you see the two slides, if you see the two pictures, depending upon the amount of pressure, the amount of insult it happens, and the timing of insult during the developmental stage, it depends that a patient may have a complete defect in the modulus. There is no lamina cribrosa. And these cases, what Dr. Levent also mentioned, 6% of IP2, you may see a gusher, which is generally not seen, but most of them have an oozer or just a pulsation. It all depends upon this pressure, which is transmitted into the cochlea and it erodes the modulus. The modular defect can be, according to the histopathology classification, can be three by four, one by four, or it may be completely absent. It may vary, but generally we don't see a gusher. So this physiology is also responsible for patients having a progressive sensorineural losses and enlarged vestibular aqueduct, as I said, is almost always present. That is why you always note a high pulsation during the CI surgery. You may not have a gusher, but you may, if there is a drop of fluid or even your saline, uh, 
you will see some pulsation as if something is being transmitted onto the round window. And because of the SV dilatation, the interscalar septum you will see as a ballooning in the histopathology. And uh, these are the cases. If you do audiological evaluation, it may not be uniform. It may vary from normal to profound loss. It may be symmetric or asymmetric on both the ears. But usually it is progressive. You can see an airborne gap at low frequencies, which you have to be careful. A third window effect from the enlarged vestibular aqueduct. Now, if you're any young child you are seeing in your OPD who has an AB gap at low frequency, and you must investigate that child before taking up these children for a uh, stapes in the children. Uh, it could be a part of an IP2 and a CT scan and followed by an MRI can give you a detailed evaluation and you may avoid that surgery. If you do a tympanometry, it can be normal with acoustic reflexes present. You may have a patient who will have an absolutely normal hearing in his young days, but head trauma. These children, uh, you should give uh, you know, information to the family that they should avoid uh, head trauma, especially playing soccer or baseball, uh, and it, they should wear helmets. And you can see with progressive loss and fluctuations, they may end up using hearing aids, and ultimately may need a cochlear implant. Now, if we look at the pre-op and intra-op radiology, it is quite routine, HRCT and MRI to be done. You will find a normal cochlear and facial nerve presence. Generally, there is no discrepancy in that. You expect a normal coil turn in the cochlea and the risk of going into IAC is very, very low in IP2. No need of post-op CT scan to confirm in IP2 and uh, clearly mentioned by Dr. Levent also that it, it has, uh, you give more radiations to patients, so a good parabital x-ray will do the needful. If you look at the surgical considerations in IP2, then a standard cortical mastodectomy with a posterior tympanotomy is the route which is being taken. You have a normal course of facial nerve in these cases, and you don't uh, actually uh, see an abnormal course, but yes, you should use facial nerve monitor in all cases of anomalies, which generally I do. The CSF, you see a pulsatile perilymph on opening the cochlea, and the pulsation at the round window is due to the third window effect of enlarged vestibular aqueduct transmitting pressure inside the cochlea. Oozer is generally more common, and gusher, as uh, we mentioned, that 6% of the cases may have a gusher depending upon the modular defect. Now, coming to the electrodes, all type of electrodes can be used, half-banded, full-banded, modular hugging, straight array, form 24, uh, even, but in cases when you have a cock stop, uh, when you have a gusher, you can use a cock stop electrode or a digisonic Evo from Oticon, which will help in plugging the site very well. And generally, if there is a gusher or an user of soft tissue packing or making a large cochleostomy is advisable. Now, in a nutshell, this is a table which I have made for IP2. If we see modulus, it is only present in the basal turn. You see an interscalar septum, it is pushed up. You can see the scala vestibuli is getting notched up and uh, it is absent between the middle and the apical turn. As a result of which the cochlear shape, the apex looks a cystic. The vestibular aqueduct is almost always enlarged. The vestibuli and the scala vestibuli are dilated. This dilatation may range from mild to moderate or maybe severe depending upon the transmission of the pressures. But the OT capsule is generally normal. You have a complete three layers of inside end ostium and chondral and the outer periosteum layer. The external architecture is absolutely normal, like a normal cochlea. And the stapes footplate is not defective uh, and it is normal, like in IP1. Uh, unlike in IP1. Uh, scala media and tympani, if you talk about these, the scala media can get compressed because of the pressures or sometimes it may be normal. But tympani is always normal, so you can have proceed with the normal cochlear insertion. We talk about the utricle, the saccule, the lateral semicircular canals, and the superior semicircular canals. They are almost always normal. And I said the three layer of endosteum is generally intact around the vestibule. These are the references, a lot of references. Thank you. And thank you very much. Thank you. Comprehensive. Now, a few questions. And then, you know, whoever wants to chip in. One is that's for LVA and IP2 both. Do we make a recommendation that the children should not be playing contact sports? Uh, this is what is mentioned in the literature. If you diagnose IP2 and uh, you Even should avoid, you should, you should actually 
give a kind of an advice to the parent that they should be they should take that sports with a you know pinch of salt or maybe a little you caution it's our recommendations that's what i'm looking at is um, it desirable to avoid even, contact sports anybody i would say yes i would say yes. yes yeah for ip2 yes Yes, L- IP two and LVA. LVA both. Right. Agree. So we are putting it only in desirable. It is desirable to avoid contact sports. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's one. Not eleven. Final word. Desirable to avoid contact sports. Um, I think I think. Can I add something? That was a very good presentation. But can I? Uh, sure, sir. Make one little change. When yes. you say. Uh, the cochlea consists of one and a half turn. I don't think we can tell the truth. Um, we should, because that reminds me cochlear hypoplasia. Hypoplasia. One and a half turn. But yeah. here we have two and a half turns. So there is no problem with the number of turns in these patients. But the only problem is we have a defect in the apex. Absolutely. Uh, connects the uh, apex and the middle turn. Uh, so that is the problem. So not the number of turns. So please, my suggestion Point not to turn. use one and a half turns for yes. IP2. Okay. Now, now the question: Is it desirable to avoid contact sports in a patient with large vestibular accurate or with IP2? Yes. This is this is what I do. I mean, I always tell. I also tell the families something else. Because I see a lot of uh, patients with n- uh, normal hearing or near normal hearing. And when you follow them, they have progressive hearing loss. So yep. one thing that we should include in these guidelines, I tell the families that there will be some uh, sudden drops. And usually they don't know what to do. We will wait until it uh, goes away. No, that night they have to take the child to the hospital to give IV steroids. So if you don't tell this to the family, they don't know actually what to do. And I think we should include this in the uh, guidelines as well. So we'll make that don't you think the same? Because, Absolutely. Uh, sometimes on Friday evening, the child suddenly loses the hearing and they wait until the Monday morning. Yes. They have to go so- uh, Friday evening because that uh, reverses the hearing back. But okay. otherwise, if they wait, uh, they become a cochlear implant candidate. Dr. Levent, can I ask you one question? I mm-hmm. read about uh, so many papers. So, so much keep it brief, uh, right? We don't have a lot yeah. of time. So your paper also says that enlarged vestibular aqueduct is almost always seen in IP2. Is this statement true or it's it's overestimated? Because I read the you black... Know, um, you know, in, I think that's a good point, Sumit. And... Um, in order to tell the reverse, we had to look at all the cochleas. Sometimes our radiology reports IP2 only without enlarged vestibular aqueduct. And when I look at the images, you know, sometimes the uh, angulation of the uh, two sides is different and also the tilt of the patient. And um, so if you, if you are uh, familiar with these um, uh, programs like Radian, that you, you put the DICOM uh, and you yes. work with it. I think you can tilt the patient so that the lateral semicircular canals are horizontal. Then you see the exact cochlea. Uh, so then if it is um, uh, incomplete partition type two, then with, with a normal vestibular uh, aqueduct, that, uh, that term uh, we can use in that situation. Do I make myself clear? Yeah, I, I think that's something we can discuss after the official thing is over because that's going to be a bit of a controversial thing out here. Okay. One thing which we mentioned is how um, what's the chance of getting a CSF gusher in IP2? 6% is two quarters? 6%. Um, percent. I think it is 6% in, in our patient uh, paper and this is a true, true gusher. Okay. So it's not uh, it's not like oozing or something else. It's a true and, gusher. And, and, and sorry. first yeah. time I met this, I went back and looked at the images, but it's an IP2. So, so that is the reason why uh, we published also in histology paper classification of modular yeah. defect. When, okay. when I look at the histopathology, 
there are different uh, stages. So, yeah. uh, so when we say IP2 in enlarged waste, we're not talking about one type. So there are varieties. And for example, this one creates a gusher, this one oozing, and this one just pulsation. Okay, so six percent gusher. Now outcomes of IP2 as good as good. fantastic. Fantastic. They are better. They are better than uh, cochleas with normal anatomy because <laughs> at, at the beginning <laughs> these children they have normal hearing. They have a progressive hearing loss. Yes, yes sir. it's progressive. So okay. so when so when we look when we, we, we uh, if you look at uh, our paper and compare we compare the audiologic outcome so they are better than the normal anatomy. Wonderful. So, Dr. Leila and Dr. Preetam, just one final brief word from your side. Yes, I just want, I'm wondering if we can add a recommendation which is desirable in cases of IB2 and the surgeon used a modular hugging electrode, it's better to have an intraoperative x ray immediately to just to make sure you don't have a tip uh, fault. Okay, so we'll, we'll get an x ray for Good all malformations. Yeah. Uh, the ex, ex, this is for Dr. Levent, actually. Uh, Dr. Levent, do you feel that we need to also measure the vertical length, uh, vertical dimension of to and the horizontal dimension both to uh, ascertain that it's an enlarged vestibular aqueduct or we just stick on with the older criteria? This is what I think because um, I look at the uh, vestibular aqueduct on, um, on axial sections it, and when we measure the dimensions, it is less than 1.5, but it is present on different sections. So when, when I look at it um, on coronal, we see that it, it runs in an oblique way. So if you make a cut horizontally, uh, according to Valvasori criteria, it may not be a, um, a enlarged vestibular aqueduct but there is pulsation in the cochlea. So I think we have to include the um, vertical dimensions as well in these okay. patients. We'll do that. Right, so we go to the next topic, IP3. Thank and you. And may I request Dr. Ali Mehros to you know, share his screen and present. And we are really short of time. So. Dr. Grover. Yep. I thought um, my presentation is with you. Are you not gonna? Okay, I'll, I'll share that. I'll share my screen then. Yeah, yeah. I hope it's visible to you. Yeah, it is visible to me now. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, can you? Um, all right, thank you. Um, Thank you, uh, Dr. Grover, for inviting me, and my thanks extend to Dr. Uh, Sunil as well. Um, so essentially, IP3, as has been touched uh, from the previous speakers, um, it is actually uh, one of the incomplete partition uh, types where the modialis uh, does not exist, but the intrascalar septa are present, but sometimes defective, they are present. Uh, the main issue with the IP3 uh, is the IAM is actually continuous with the cochlea. So there is a, a missing lamina cribrosa, which essentially, uh, that, that's why the CSF actually floods directly to the uh, cochlea when we uh, operate on these patients. Uh, but as has been mentioned, the normal length and diameter of the cochlea is actually within the uh, normal limits as opposed to the hypoplasia types. Can we go to the next one? I'll show from my side here. Is it? Is uh, it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, as you can see here, uh, the, uh, it looks like what I like to call actually Christmas tree essentially. Uh, where the, there is no modulus, the lateral, the medial end of the uh, of the cochlear part is very dilated and is directly continuous with the IAM. Can we go for the next slide, please? Yeah. So as you can see here, the IAM is in direct continuity with the uh, cochlear vestibular part. Next one, please. So um, 
this is one of IPs where actually it's an X-link disease where it is uh, essentially happens in males. So very, very rarely to see it in, uh, in girls. So it's an X-link disease and it is the rarest of the three types really uh, from the statistical perspective. Next one, please. So uh, these patients, they may actually present early childhood. They may present later on in life. And the presentation could be uh, audiologically conductive hearing loss, mixed hearing loss, or uh, sensorineural hearing loss. And as I said, it only affects males who are primarily, I wouldn't say really only. And, and, and preoperative meningitis is really uncommon as opposed to IP1. Uh, simply because the endostium in IP3 is intact uh, versus the endostium is defective in IP1. Now, uh, intraoperative, the primary issue for the surgeon, as uh, uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Levent mentioned, that it is actually IP3 is difficult for the surgeon, but the outcome for the patient is better as opposed to IP1. Um, now, the gusher is uh, almost all, always happen with these patients. Um, and and the, the main uh, concern for the surgeon, in addition to the gusher, is the inserting the electrode into the internal odotimiatus. Can we go for the next slide, please? Next slide, please. Same there. Yeah, so when we look at the, has been published in this rare condition before, uh, there is the uh, Abdullah group uh, from Germany, and I think that was shared by uh, some groups of Saudi Arabia. They actually uh, looked at nine patients from 1999 to 2014, and the, the majority of these patients were actually adult patients. Two of them were children, and it was it were reported that the children were actually mentally subnormal. What they did, uh, well, unexpectedly really, they actually used the perimodular electrodes, uh, 18 millimeter, or obviously a cochlear company. Uh, and they, they, they used cochleostomy in all of these patients, and all of the patients had gusha. None of them did not have a gusha. And the results, according to them, were actually suboptimal, uh, comparing it with their uh, peers in, in normal cochlea. Uh, now, there is another group. Uh, well, uh, the, this was uh, in the UK. They actually looked at two patients. Uh, it was the, with Shark Said, who's well known in that field. And they looked at two patients. And these two patients uh, had. Uh, one of them had meningitis post-operatively, and that's why they actually recommended to do subtotal petrosectomy in the second child. And they used the fluoroscopic imaging as has been uh, touched on uh, previously. And actually the recommendation of Shaq Saeed and Haron Saeed is uh, this group is to really use fluoroscopic imaging in all of the IP3 patients and to do subtotal petrosectomy in all of these uh, patients. Uh, contrary to the, uh, what has been actually uh, discussed, uh, I'm gonna show it in the next slide. Can I go for the next slide, please? Next slide, please. Yeah, it's, it's I'm on the next slide. I yeah, okay. So Smeds uh, AL, this group uh, from Sweden, they actually studied 10 children uh, and, uh, they did not do any subtotal petrosectomy. And they used the, the straight electrode and they did the genetic studies for all of them. And it was POU3F4. And all of them had this uh, gene mutation. Uh, and according to this group, uh, as I said, they did not do any subtotal petrosectomy and uh, they, they did not encounter any major issues according to them. And they used the medel implant in all of these patients, uh, understandably. But the length that they used, actually 24 millimeter rather than 18 millimeter that has been used uh, by uh, Abdullah Group in, in, in Germany. Uh, the next slide, please. So um, looking at all what has been published before, I, I came across this is systematic review of the outcomes after cochlear implantation. Uh, and that was published in 2000, this year really, early this year. 
by the Smith AL, and they oh. looked at 14 articles on 61 children. And, and, and they, they said the majority of the studies demonstrate that cochlear implantation provides improvements in hearing and speech performance in patients with X-linked deafness. But they definitely agree that it would be suboptimal uh, compared to the uh, counterparts. Next slide, please. <coughs> so in conclusion, uh, CI in IP3 is doable. Extra care has to be given to dealing with uh, gusha and IM insertion. And CI improves the performance of these uh, patients, both auditory and speech. But the question, as we really discuss this in emerging nations, which to me uh, implicates that, you know, financially constrained uh, countries. Uh, so the question is, uh, should we actually do, uh, should we actually uh, do the cochlear implantation uh, as in government funded program? This is what I meant, not privately, uh, uh, for IP3 patients. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I think I think a very comprehensive, you know, literature search which you did for this, and definitely that answers majority of questions. I think a major question which he asked, and I think we'll have to maybe answer here or later is the government funding. Should we really give it for IP3 or not? That's something. Uh, in, in, in Egypt, uh, Monish is, is not actually uh, allowed. Is not because. Uh, you know, have plenty of, uh, of normal cochlear children waiting, yeah. uh, and we have limited number of implants. So it's not actually the national insurance, nat national health, health insurance in Egypt doesn't actually uh, agree about implanting these kids. Okay, so these are the guidelines which, which we probably can avoid from our side because, you know, that's something which, can, which country specific can handle from their side. And anything else to be added in IP3? I think pretty well managed thing. Gusher almost 100% results not as good. Um, and uh, no initial meningitis. Don't use modulus hugging electrodes. So we're pretty okay with it, right? Yeah, well, that has been Thank your you. comment, unless uh, okay. Levin has a different opinion. No, I think very, very well presented. So that's something we can, you know, now go to. Nothing to add. Wonderful. And Dr. Lela, can we have your presentation now? And in, in interest of safety of time, can we have common cavity as well as cochlear hyperplasia one and two in the same presentation? And as a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Manish, when you when you sent, you said to do four minutes, so I made my presentation very brief. <laughs> That's okay. I'm I'm happy if you have done that. At least somebody listened. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Uh, as I, I was, I'm supposed to talk about the hypoplastic cochlea type one, type two, and common cavity. So, uh, hypoplastic, hypoplastic cochlea type uh, in general, they are um, the external architecture of these cochlea are normal, but uh, they are hypoplastic. They are uh, small in size, so they are small cochlea. So this is why I put this slide. Really, I don't know if Levent agree with me. What I use in uh, my unit, I used always to measure the height of the cochlea to decide is this a hypoplastic cochlea or not. And in this very extensive study, it shows us that there is a range between uh, the height of the cochlea. It should be between 3.3 .3 and 4.8. So what is less than 3.3 .3 is a hypoplastic or a small cochlea. So we have the external dimension is more or less is normal, but the internal organization, it could be normal or it could be abnormal. So we start with a hypoplastic cochlea type two. It's a bud-like cochlea, which is a small bud, rounded or ovoid in shape, and it has an internal auditory canal. So the cochlea is coming from an internal auditory canal. This is to differentiate it for, from rudimentary autocyst. And uh, this cochlea, which is very small millimeter, uh, uh, it ha doesn't have any modulus or intrascalar septum. So these patients, they have almost, and there is no hearing, and they are not candidate definitely for cochlear implant, and they need uh, uh, API. This is why I have a question here. I have chance, I catch the chance to ask why we did not include, or Levin did not include this hypoplastic cochlear type one with uh, complete labyrinthine aplasia, or the cochlear aplasia, uh, and uh, the 
the third one, which is uh, the rudimentary autocyst. I think I think this should be included under them, where cochlear implant is uh, absolutely contraindicated, and the patient will benefit from ABI only. Uh, we'll go to hypoplastic cochlea type two. This is exactly like the hypo, the incomplete partition type one but the cochlea is smaller in size. So the cochlea, it has a small dimension again, and the external outline, it looks like a cochlea, but it's lacking a modulus and an intrascalar septum, and it has a wide connection. The cochlear aperture is wide connecting with the internal auditory canal. Again, uh, it could be a lamina papricia, it could be, it could be present, or uh, lamina cribrosa, it could be a present or absent. Uh, the vestibular aqueduct, it could be dilated. We can have enlarged vestibular aqueduct, and we can have with it a uh, dilated vestibule. Uh, in these children, uh, the patients, they, they may demonstrate a full spectrum of hearing loss. The majority of them, they will have severe to profound hearing loss, and they are candidate for cochlear implant, condition that the cochlear nerve is present. But if these cases, the cochlear nerve is absent, then they are contraindication for cochlear implant and they should have an ABI. Uh, they can have, uh, these children, they can have mild hearing loss, moderate hearing loss, and these, they can be habilitated with a hearing aid. Uh, again, a pure conductive hearing loss or mixed hearing loss, they are not uncommon in these children. And these, they may benefit from stable surgery with or without hearing aid with counseling for future, maybe they will need cochlear implant. Uh, in regard to the electrotype type and any surgical tips in uh, cochlear hypoplasia type two, where we have no modulus, no intrascalar septum, and there is wide connection with the internal auditory canal, a full banded non-modular hugging electrode is advisable to use. And uh, if uh, the cochlear aperture uh, is larger, uh, is large, then uh, I really advise to use as uh, in the literature and uh, what I do use is an elect straight electrode with uh, a stopper, whether it is uh, one from middle form, Levent electrode form 19, or you can use, it's also present in the DigiSonic. They have a, an electrode with a stopper. Uh, again, here we stress these patients, they are more prone to develop a gusher. Uh, I hear, here, I really want to stress one point, uh, which is it has been mentioned twice, the subtotal vitrisectomy. I think the key point is to stop the gusher. And uh, subtotal vitrisectomy with a blind sac is just uh, complementary to separate the middle ear from infection and from to decrease the incidence of infection. But there is no point to do a subtotal vitrisectomy and a blind sac if you still have a leak or a gusher. So number one is to close the gusher completely 100%. Uh, facial nerve malposition can be present, especially the vertical segment of the facial nerve, and especially in the cases where you have uh, the lateral semicircular canal is hypoplastic. I faced case in 50% of my cases where I have lateral or apparent uh, facial nerve, which is lateral to the lateral semicircular canal. So in these cases, the surgeon should be really ready for a substitute approach. He cannot approach the wrong window niche from a facial recess. So you can have three alternatives. You can have an alternative with uh, uh, retrofacial, or you can have uh, a gutter through the external auditory canal, which Levin do, or you can have uh, by model things where you can elevate a tympanometer flap and you go with your electrode through the, and you just enlarge a dictotomy, which I did in five cases. Uh, again, in these cases, because it's hypoplastic, the promontory may have uh, the patient, I mean, the surgeon through a post, uh, facial recess and a posterior tympanatomy, he might have difficulty to, to recognize the promontory and the round window niche. And in this case, he might accompany it, uh, do tympanometer flap to see his anatomy. Uh, when to do an ABI in uh, cochlear hypoplasia type 2? whenever you have cochlear nerve deficiency, okay? Uh, I mean, when we have, we have two options. The best option is in these cases is to perform cochlear implant uh, and decide with the better develop a cochlear nerve 
or a better audiological performance of the child. Okay, if there is a limited hearing benefit or a language benefit from cochlear implant, then an ABI should be considered in the contra contralateral ear. Or when you have in the cases where you are very, you are sure from your MRI and from the audiology that the patient he doesn't have a cochlear nerve, so ABI is the indication. Of course, it has been reported, I think four cases by Levent. There is cases where they do a cochlear implant in one case where they have a hypoplastic nerve and simultaneously in the same time, a uh, uh, brainstem implant where they have an absent cochlear nerve and the results has been published already. I will proceed for the common cavity for time saving. Okay, in the common cavity, uh, the cochlea and the vestibule semicircular canals, they are represented, they are present, but they are represented in one cavity. And uh, this cavity, it doesn't have uh, any modulus or intrascalar septum. The size of the cavity is not uniform, so the surgeon should measure the sphere of this cavity to decide the length of his uh, of the electrode array if he's going to do a cochlear implant. Uh, the point is that the internal auditory canal usually enter this cavity from the center, which we can see here like this one. Sometimes the semicircular canals, rudimentary part of it is represented in this cavity and it will look like this. And we can see here very clearly how the internal auditory canal enter the center of this cavity. These uh, points, they are very important in differentiating between a common cavity and uh, differentiating cochlear uh, aplasia with a dilated uh, vestibule. The other thing in common cavity, theoretically, we assume that the nerve which go into this cavity is a common cochlear vestibular nerve. But this nerve, it has really to be demonstrated in heavily weighted uh, three Tesla MRI, and it can see it here clearly in this. The other point again, which has been mentioned, how much cochlear nerve present in this common cochlear vestibular nerve, it depends on extensive uh, audiological assessment, behavior assessment of the child. As I said, it's very important in these uh, in common cavity to be differentiated from cochlear aplasia with dilated vestibule. Uh, and as you can see that in the common cavity, the internal auditory canal is open at the center of the cavity. The cavity, in some cases, you find it in a close relationship with the posterior, uh, with the posterior, with the, uh, uh, with the brain or the posterior cranial fossa. In the cochlear aplasia with a dilated vestibule, you can see that it is in relation, this cavity is in relation to the fundus, it is posterior lateral, which is the common relation of the vestibule. And you can see the dilated vestibule and you can see semicircular canal, which is uh, either it could be normal or a hypoplastic and dilated. Uh, the importance is very clear because these cases, you cannot do cochlear implant and these patients, they might benefit from cochlear implant, even though we can face some cases where it is really difficult to differentiate between the two from just the CT scan. Regarding the audiology of these patients, these patients, they usually have profound hearing loss so ideological evaluation is very important, as I said, to determine if the hearing uh, is present in these patients with common cavity, because we want to, need to know exactly what's the amount of cochlear nerve which is present in, in a common cochlear vestibular nerve, which we can see in the MRI. This is if it is present in the MRI. And in fitting the children, uh, it might show some nystagmus, which will need some modifications of the sea level. Uh, and with time, this nystagmus, it will disappear due to stimulation, of course, of the common uh, vestibular cochlear nerve. The management of the children with the common cavity, cochlear implant is indicated if we can see the common cochlear vestibular nerve. And API is indicated in two situations as uh, the only option if the cochlear vestibular nerve uh, is not present 
or if it is questionable because a very long, slim internal auditory canal with a patient with a normal facial nerve. So most likely this child, he has just a facial nerve. Or it could be, the ABI it could be as a second option in the contralateral ear. Ear in the cases, as I said, if the child develop poor language or not good hearing after cochlear implant in the first year. Uh, the electrode type and uh, these children are common cavities. It's better to have straight full banded electrode, non modular hugging, and uh, it will have. So we need the position to be in the periphery uh, of the common cavity or of this sac to have a better contact with all present neural elements or a neural tissue inside the cavity. The surgical approach, as usually, it's a transmastoid labyrinthotomy. So you just do a cortical mastoidectomy and you will see the bulge, which looks uh, of the lateral semicircular canal supposed to be, but this is the bulge of the common cavity. And there will you do your labyrinthotomy. The technique, it has been described fully by McNevin at uh, uh, which he used, and I think which is Levent used. Another uh, electrode, it has been uh, described, well, and uh, this electrode, it has a special, uh, especially designed for the common cavity, and it has an inactive tip, which can be caught by a hook through another hole. So there is two techniques uh, to do this, and uh, there is one electrode has been advised to be used. All this to make sure that the electrode is in the periphery and it doesn't go into the internal auditory canal. This, I think, which make in cases of common cavity, uh, intraoperative x-ray, I think it should be a mandatory. And uh, there is, as I mentioned, variation in the size of the common cavity. So the correct length of the electrode, it should be have calculated by a simple mathematical how to calculate the circumference of a circle. Uh, as I said, there is a chances of entering the electrode into the internal auditory canal. This is why we don't want to use the modular hugging electrode. And this is why I advise or, uh, to do an intraoperative X-ray before you close the patient. Uh, the outcomes of cochlear implant in general in inner ear malformations, uh, it has been reported in many literature that inner ear malformation significantly influence hearing outcomes over time following a cochlear implant surgery when compared to pediatric patient with normal anatomy. I find exception in one article where the inner ear malformation in children perform equally with a normal uh, cochleas, but in this article, most of the ear malformation, it was in large vestibular aqueduct. In regard to speech perception outcome, they are notably below those of patients with normal anatomy, except for cases with enlarged, again, vestibular aqueduct. The most important factors collectively I found to determine the outcome, it was the child at the, the age of the child at the time of implantation, the duration of hearing loss before uh, cochlear implantation, if the child has a comorbidity, and the extent of inner ear malformation, the gusher, incomplete uh, insertion, and abnormal facial nerve. So recommendation for cochlear implant in inner ear malformations, awareness again toward increased risk of complication, uh, in cases of inner ear malformation, it has been described that uh, there is a significantly larger risk of meningitis, and it has been reported when child with complete and full immunization and still he developed meningitis. The simultaneous CI and ABI has a role in certain patients with inner ear malformations. Uh, take home message. Uh, the factors which really found it to influence all inner ear malformation. I think from all the discussion has been done, severity of inner ear malformation play a major role. And it was very clear where we find that IB1 and uh, hypoplastic type 1, they are worse or common cavity. The cochlear nerve, whether it is hypoplastic or absent, the pre audiology, the duration with the hearing loss, the comorbidity, and the intraoperative challenges, which is incomplete insertion, gusher, and abnormal facial nerve. These are my references, and thank you. Thank you. Much. Again, a very comprehensive thing. I think covered almost everything. And the question which you asked, CH1 can be clubbed with kind of rudimentary autocyst and consider that for ABI. You know, I think. Um, um, we have some patients, even though the cochlea is very small, 
they have good audiological um, response during testing. And with CI, they have a response. So I think um, um, rudimentary orthosis is an ABI indication, but these children very rarely, they become uh, cochlear implant candidates. So uh, it is better to include them uh, in hypoplasias, even though the outcome is not uh, very good, but uh, the correct location should be, I think, hypoplasia. And, and I mean, when it is a few millimetric, like the CT, which we have been, I've seen just one patient with, yeah. I mean, type one, it's really just a few millimeters. So, I mean, what's the length of the electrode which I can put there? Usually half of the electrode goes in. It or, uh, but but that, that stimulates. So we had some patients from different countries and also from Turkey, they use that electrode. They use that electrode. But I mean, the outcome is not super. Right. You have to know this. Dr. Monish, I have yeah. to leave. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed the presentations of everybody, but I have to go because it was, uh, I know that it was two hours only. So uh, yeah. I had my, schedule uh, prepared for that. Thank I wish you. you a successful meeting and thank everybody for their excellent presentations. I think we covered many aspects of the uh, malformations. Thank you, Dr. Levent, and thank you. we will be getting thank back you. to you. Thank you. Thank you. Levent, Levent, I'm just making sure you're available for us Friday early morning, Indian yeah. Standard. Yeah. yeah, I will do my best soon. Good man, good man, all right. Okay. okay, bye bye. Thank you, bye bye. Okay. And next talk, uh, Dr. Hetal, can we have yours? Cochlear hypoplasia three and four. Yeah. Let's keep it short and sweet. Can you share your screen, ma'am? I thank uh, the entire Sigit team yep. for having here. Most of the things are already discussed as far as the cochlear hypoplasia is concerned. I will concentrate only on to the type 3 and 4. Yeah, uh, in whole, it presents it represents 15% of the cochlear malformations. And it's one of the most interesting group of inner ear malformations with a very clinical and audiological uh, presentation. Yeah. The, there is a differentiation between cochlea and vestibule. And basically, it is a miniaturized cochlea with various internal architecture abnormality. Cochlea with less than two tons with a short modulus is present as far as the type 3 is concerned. Less than, here you can see that there are less than two cochlear tons and very, very short modulus. There. So, as far as the radiology is concerned, you will see cochlea small but with normal external outline, which is less than two tons. Modulus is shorter. Interscalar septum, overall length is reduced. Vestibule and superior semicircular canal are usually hypoplastic. And cochlea aperture is also aplastic or hypoplastic. As far as the cochlea hypoplasia type 4 is concerned, there is co cochlea with hypoplastic middle and apical tones. Uh, middle and apical tones may be fused and they will be placed little anteriorly. So this part which is fused is placed a bit anteriorly. So to summarize, the cochlea will again have a normal basal tone, but severely mm -hmm. hypoplastic middle and apical tones. Middle and apical turns will be located anteriorly and medially rather than in the normal central position, while facial now is placed anteriorly because of the hypoplastic lateral semicircular canal. As far as the syndromic association is concerned, it is type 4 may be associated with the alpha uh, dystrophic lichen disorders like Bokulbabu disorder and Fukuyama. Uh, congenital muscular dystrophy and charge syndrome. So when you have a patient with muscular dystrophy, you have to be very careful when you're giving NFCCR muscle relaxant to be used very carefully. 
or could be avoided and patient can be kept deep. When you are dealing with the type 3, uh, it is usually associated with Gordon-Berg syndrome. And these are the other few associations with the uh, syndrome, but isomic 13 and 18 usually survives for a very little time. And Pallister Hall syndrome patients will all have multiple other anomalies and there is a lot of cerebral anomaly also, so they don't do overall well. Coming to the Wardenburg syndrome, it will be, it is an autosomal dominant syndrome with yeah. or unilateral or bilateral. Uh, it may affect both the ears. And it is because of the mutation of leading to a genesis of melanocytes. So anything which melanocytes are involved. So that is how the defect is trivascular is there, and structural defect is there in the organ of cortex. And the associated features between the melanocyte will be white forelock and heterochroma iriditis and partial albinism. You have four types where we can I'll not go into much of detail, yeah. but uh, organic segment is again a derivative from the melanocyte. So that's how you get Hirschsprung associated with that. Uh, you can have their siblings having uh, deformities in the uh, eyes. Like this was the child whose sister had operated with deafness, but this child did not have. While here the mother had normal hearing and both the children were implanted. And again here the Elder brother is having hydrochromia, but no deafness. So you can have very presentation and there may be escape. So more than three features are present, then it is uh, significant. Mm -hmm. There is association with Tarth syndrome. So you must, all anomalous cochlear, rather we do all the uh, cochlear implant must undergo to the echo, ECT, and uh, ophthalmic evaluation so that you see the associated anomalies. And especially when there is abnormal cochlea, you must do thorough evaluation of other systems. Yeah. There is associated with Pendred syndrome also. But it usually represents that's that's not for hypoplasia, no? That's only for LVA. But one of the articles does mention, so I was Actually, confused. But I was wondering if it's okay, ma'am. Right. So and also some association with branchiotorinal syndrome. Okay. where you will have just pre auricular pits and hearing loss can be varied. Right. Audiologically, it is very interesting that you have full spectrum of hearing loss. You can have mild, moderate, profound, sensitive hearing loss, and type 3 and type 4 sometimes have pure conductive hearing loss or mixed hearing loss. And these are the patients, some of them do very well it's only with stapy And uh, even I'm, I, I'm not very sure about whether we should talk about the gersher or not. Because by rule, uh, if the modulus is absent, you can get gersher. In type 3 and type 4, because so of that's the... Only, that's only type 2. So, type yeah. three, and four, there are no so 3 and 4, because of the narrow aperture, you don't get the DSF yeah. as often. So, one has to correctly use the method, whether you need a hearing aid or CI or ABI, depending upon the uh, yes. No. Everybody knows. Side of ear to be implanted in any of the anomalies. As, if there is an asymmetrical anomaly, is there in 40%. So, better side should be operated. And uh, wherever there is a delayed hearing loss, you should do it. And other associated anomalies should be looked into. And patient's preference also can be asked. And surgeon's dexterity. Can also decide which site to operate. The electrode used as far as the uh, CH3 and 4 is concerned that you need a shorter and thin electrode is advisable. Uh, maybe cochlear duct length can help us in deciding. And number of cochlear turns are usually smaller with narrower in it. So thinner but full band can be used. And size of hypoplasia should be assessed to decide the electrode. And the selection of the electrode array is the choice. And responsibility of the clinic based on the specific characteristics of ease. 
Usually straight electrode because it rests up against the lateral wall. And electrode self fixes by spring pressure on the lateral wall. Here, very little chance of going into the IAC because of the uh, yeah, small or something. So, potential electrode choice would be uh, the straight electrode uh, or a metal compressed electrode is ideal actually because of the uh, narrower uh, space. I really don't know whether we should talk in any of the anomalies about the use of dead gauge because yeah. then you would know uh, how much your electrode would go inside. And as far as the challenges are concerned, with CH3, CH4, there is an expected facial or malposition because of the poor development of the semicircular canal. So it's usually situated in front. Uh, a lot of time there is an absence of promontory protuberance. So that makes it still difficult. Uh, in identifying the round window. And sometimes one may require a transcanal approach or uh, there may be a need for fracturing the canal wall. Uh, in cases where the round window is just not identifiable, uh, there are reports where the uh, electrode was introduced through the oval window. So here, one of the cases where the mm -hmm. canal wall had to be fractured and pushed forward uh, to get the excess. Perfect, but let's avoid a video, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. So, intraoperatively having facial now monitor is very useful. Uh, as we already discussed about CM is a must. Proroscopy guided if it is, is desirable. You can have incomplete insertion. Uh, you can have also migration of the electrode because of the shorter length. If you have put a longer electrode, may migrate outside. And facial simulation can also uh, be a problem. Yeah. yeah. And all those with the cochlear pressure, aplasia, or cochlear or hypoplasia, ABI mm -hmm. would be the answer. So I think we have discussed everything. Perfect. I think that covered everything. A nice thank you, actually. So, yeah, so that, that covers everything on cochlear hypoplasia. I think. That was a very exhaustive thing again for both all the one, two, three, and four. Coming to the end, Pritam, or does anybody want to add anything? Three and four cochlear hypoplasias? I think that's pretty exhaustive anyhow. Okay, Pritam, can we have you all talk a very short one, I suppose, on rudimentary autosis? Ma'am, can you stop sharing? Yeah, Pritam. Okay. Yeah. Keep it short. Okay. So you're able to hear me, Dr. Manish? Yep. Okay. So I'm going to be uh, very fast and very simple. So talking about cochlear aplasia, I don't want to go into the uh, no, details of how to diagnose it. We are all very much aware. Most important is that you don't have a promontory. That's something that you need to keep in your mind. There are two types mm, with normal labyrinth or with dilated vestibule. Uh, audiological findings, as uh, uh, it was it was stressed in the initial talk, no hearing thresholds or responses are detected. In the, if at all you find any low frequency response, then it's only a vibro uh, tactile stimulation and not because of the uh, nerve. Uh, genetics, uh, this has been associated again as has already been uh, mentioned before. The treatment option is a uh, auditory brainstem implant. The controversy here is there are numerous case reports and one of the reports, uh, well, many reports in fact, that which talk about uh, where preoperatively they had some response or behavioral responses and they have done a CI and then they have had responses over a period of time and this is something uh, that is debatable and that needs to be discussed by all of us. Autocyst, uh, uh, it's, it's an incomplete millimetric uh, rounded uh, ovoid structure which is present with lack of uh, an internal artery canal. And uh, this is a very, very uh, clear cut indication for going for an ABI. There are no hearing thresholds or, or whatever you get is only vibrotactile stimulation over there. And there are no genetics which have been described in literature as of now that I, I could get my hands on. So complete labyrinthine aplasia again, uh, 
uh, there is complete absence of cochlea vestibule and all the semicircular canals and the aqueducts. Uh, uh, the internal artery canal usually just has the facial nerve in it and uh, the, the middle ear ossicles might be no normal and based on the petrus and the uh, otic capsule, now uh, they can again be of three varieties and uh, then you can just put them in any, any of the uh, category that you want to. Same audiological findings, no cochlear responses of whatsoever. And uh, these are some of the syndromes that have been described, uh, which again has been um, uh, discussed okay. before. So the treatment option is uh, auditory brainstem implant. Thank you. Thank you. So, and I think we keep it clear in our guidelines. Dr. Asha, can you, Asha ma'am, can you share your presentation in the meantime? Uh, in the guidelines, we don't mention cochlear implants or cochlear aplasia, you know, which you mentioned in one of your slides. So yeah. only ABI. Dr. Only Asha, ABI. Can we have your habilitation part quickly now? Is she here? Yeah. Hi, audiological is opening again and again instead of the I think you just need to change. Yeah, uh, just a minute. It's uh, audiology is opening instead of the just one minute. Hello, after, after the exhausting discussion and all the hard work all the surgeons have done for the surgery and deciding the electrode now, they're waiting for the heavy literature and how the candidate is going to perform. So I will highlight here a few points. So to track the progress of the recipient, the standardized test recommended pre-implant and post-implant every three months are uh, ongoing assessment for integrated scale development, CAPE, May 6 sound test, and MQ. So the six uh, sound test is the most preferred test because it is easy to estimate, administer, and it gives frequency-specific information about the audition. Outcome could be limited such, in such children, child, and there could be a range of outcome possible depending on the extent of the anomalies. What we must remember that the timeline may be delayed and it may be beyond a point. So the factors which are affecting the outcome are associated problems, age of implantation, OCI added thresholds, degree of malformation and MAP optimizing and the processor they are using. Now looking here, we have five level of auditory skill pyramids, which are the deciding factor where the child is stagnant and beyond which time the additional modality should be used. For example, if child is stagnant at awareness of the sound or at the supra segmental or association with the identification. So wherever there is a stagnancy, we move for associated skills development. So points to be considered for our goals, the clinician should use the different approaches and focus on the communication and on the conceptual learning. The family counseling is the more important as the timeline may be longer to achieve the goal. For sustaining the recipient in the therapy program, the family counseling needs to be consistent, intensive, to explain them the realistic expectations. A few auditory techniques which to, should be used emphatically is acoustic highlighting, auditory bombardment, auditory sandwich, mother's voice, repetition, and prompt. So the spectrum of the communication should be followed, like depending on the extent of the cochlear anomaly, 
a range of outcome expected some may achieve only awareness or close identification so we must work on the holistic development so the different approaches to be used are auditory verbal auditory oral cued speech total communication manual code language or a sign language there are some studies and publication on this Gover et al in 2017 publication shows study across all the cochlear malformation he reports significant improvement in cape score over 2 years post implant and maximum score in large vestibular duct in type 1 mondini malformation grover et al reported statistically significant difference in pre and post me score from 4.32 to 34.56 in type 2 cases similar results are published and it me scores from 5.6 to 34.56 and sir from 1.16 to 3.8 ma'am these outcomes are based on a different classification so let's avoid this because we okay, use so, classification here so okay so these are all the studies which yeah. i have put uh, so okay. shall i avoid all this yes yes because these are different classifications we yeah this one is okay in large which one suriatal no. studied in mondini dysplasia outcome post implant one year found similar speech perception score as normal as is normal as in the anatomically normal cases lina et al studies the isolated and large equiduct cases of 551 and reported considerable benefit in audiology and speech perception score and luna et al publication on incomplete partition cape scores 6 after 23.3 months of the mean score So when I let on reports the hearing threshold of all malformed cases similar to normal structure cochlear post op 6 months and he found improvement in speech discrimination score and spoken language in 6 months Okay Now in study in uh, SMS type 3 well, case we are not um, going to get into this classification for Okay the, fine sure. So shall I conclude Perfect yeah Okay in conclusion surgery may be challenging and may need special design electrode recipient family need to understand the predicted outcome may be variable guided prognosis depending on the severity of malformation and outcome will be affected keep close watch on the performance assessment and the prognosis is, should be at the regular interval regular therapy and family to carry over at home they may need oral oral or oral method of total communication so the recommendations are use of wireless accessories assistive listening device fm systems do not hesitate to make referrals if they do not have all the facilities that the child may need at your clinic and take the written consent in their own language with their own handwriting and make them sign thank you yeah thank you thank you ma'am I think that's the last presentation, and it's been actually we have extended by more than thirty minutes the time allotted to us. If anybody has a specific point to make, then actually we can. Otherwise, I think what. Um, to Grover. Right. Yeah, Grover. Can I yes. just uh, make few points here, uh, if you allow me? Um, Go ahead, sir. I think for the my understanding that th this meeting is really for the purpose of devising recommendations. Uh, yeah. uh given the context of emerging nations and that's my understanding so um accordingly i think if we were to make any recommendation i think what we we need to do is to answer uh the question the, the the few questions one is the are we making recommendations uh within the context of emerging nations as financially constrained or economically constrained countries uh, that's number one and the second are we actually making these recommendations for uh, government funded cochlear yeah. implant programs are we actually making it because from my point of view that every single child is implantable except yeah. absent cochlea and hypoplasia type 1 and 2 any other patients from my point of view is actually implantable 
But we're not talking about this. We're talking about government funded or financially constrained government funded programs. Uh, and, and, and I think that makes a huge difference as to what kind of recommendation we uh, as kind of scientific body of opinion we're gonna come up with. So unless we make these distinctions, I think probably we, we would disagree with each other uh, yeah. about what we recommend as essential uh, or as desirable as you pointed out in your uh, previous emails. Thank you. I think a point well taken and Dr. Sunil that is here with us, you know, if, yeah. if we need to- so, really... so Monish, yeah, great. So can I take it from here? Yeah. Uh, Ali, I really appreciate your uh, last comment and that was exactly what I had in mind. This came about after the meeting that we had in Egypt where you moderated uh, one of the uh, world cafes as well and, and uh, brilliantly so. So yes, we agree with you. We need to make this distinction that we are representing GCIN countries in our uh, guidelines and recommendations. And so we talk about strong recommendation, recommendation and option and recommendation against. So I yeah. think uh, those have been uh, discussed. And I think we will also make this uh, distinction that you beautifully pointed out when there is a government program or a national health service taking care of the funding of the implant uh, uh, program, the cochlear implants, we need to have some recommendations specific to that uh, because of the cost effectiveness of that, the cost benefit analysis comes into play as well. I think we yeah. keep that in mind. And, and we, we also look at self-funded programs as well. Uh, so I think we'll try our best to make that distinction when we put the recommendations together. Yeah. Fantastic work, all of you. Absolutely fabulous, mind blowing, mind boggling. In fact, mm -hmm. I, uh, Nish clearly said we could do an all day symposium on cocktail management. I have spent 30 years trying to understand, and, and the more and more I learn about it, I think I know the less and less. So I, th I think you did a wonderful job, Monish, and all your panelists, your valuable uh, inputs and insights. No, no, no one's talking, Pritam, I've taken over. So, and uh, all that I want to say is let's put all this together and Monish is going to try his best to summarize it for Sunday morning in 12 minutes. And I don't know how he's going to do that. Um, <laughs> the attempt is to keep in touch, keep this communication live for the next yeah. month, be in that WhatsApp group and in that email uh, loop and please put all your thoughts together with your references. Let's make this a publication. We yeah. want to make a publication, all seven of our World Cafes, we want to put that together in a peer reviewed journal. Thank you all. Great to have you all with us. One last announcement, housekeeping. You'll all get your delegate uh, uh, platform link in a day or two, just a day before the conference. Uh, <laughs> which you will log into for all three days of the conference. But if you have additional responsibilities, contributions as, a, as an invited lecturer or a panelist in a, in a common panel, you will get a sessions link as well, like the Zoom link you got today, where you will log into and log session. So at that time, you'll be off the platform. Thank you all. Thank Thanks. you very much. Good night. Recording. Uh, Thanks, Thank Manish. You. Thank, you. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. It was an excellent brainstorming session. Excellent. Thank you.